computer. So uh, welcome everyone to our February 1st Fridays. Um, we've had a little break for um, a while. You know, we had a little discussion last time, but but um, this time we've put together a panel to, to discuss arching. Um, and we have a very distinguished panel of violin makers. I think they're all very well known to all of us here. So um, consisting of uh, Joseph Curtin, um, Fang Zhang, Martin Schleski, Samuel Zygmuntovich, and Andrew Ryan. So Joseph is going to uh, uh, moderate this panel discussion. So Joseph. Um, so um, welcome everyone. I, I, I have thought a lot about arching through most of my career, except to do sensible archings and or and or copy whatever's um, you're, you're you're trying to work with. Um, but recently, I paid a bit more attention to it and talked to a few uh, makers. I um, had some good conversations with Sam about it, and um, I realized there's it's interesting good. things to be said about it. Um, and particularly, um, it's noteworthy, I think, how little scientific research is correct. I'll find. Uh, I'll get somebody to sort it. In. Hey, hey, George, your microphone's on. There we go. Um, so it seems to me there hasn't been a lot of um, scientific work done. I would guess in part because it's not easy to quantify it um, in quite the way it is with, let's say, tap tones and, and bridges and things. Um, so, but there's been an increasing sense, I think, um, as we get better acquainted with the effects of tap tones, you know, their limits, their usefulness, and with bridge tuning, and with varnishes and all the other things that have been turned over a lot, um, what's left to um, sort of sort out. And I think arching is one of them. I think we all agree they're important. So I'm just interested in hearing my colleagues um, give their, their their sense of it. So um, um, let's go ahead then. And Martin, you're gonna start us off. So I stop, okay. Okay, and then wait a little bit. Okay. First, maybe I give you a, a little insight in the workshop first, um, a very brief insight. This is the workshop house, which I'm working in um, since several years and it was made in 1600, but we, um, well, we, we restored everything. So it's three floors, first floor making, the second floor of the house is the um, acoustic analysis with laboratories and the third floor is what you see here, the, the music room, this listening room for the musicians. So I must, how doesn't go on the next slide doesn't work. How, why doesn't it work? Let me see. Obviously, ah, okay, I have to do this one. So this is the first floor. The, just very normal what you all do as well. Um, we are working three people there, um, only making new instruments. The second floor, the laboratories and um, the vanishing laboratory and the acoustic laboratory is the whole second floor. And um, so we cook all our varnishes ourselves and the pigments, which you see on this picture, which is great fun. And uh, well, this, is the, the first floor for making new instrument. And I think this tool is the normal tool for measuring archings, which you all uh, certainly know and you all use. Um, I use another tool to measure arching of um, the violin, the viola and the cello, which you can see here. Um, it's an electronic XYZ coordinate table. Still, this is not the most modern thing to do. Of course, there are um, other methods of measuring arching very accurate. But it's a it's a very um, accurate tool to measure arching and to get them into an electronic shape into Excel and so you can analyze uh, the values with Excel sheets, um, which is um, quite useful when you compare instruments, different instruments. Um, so and this um, this device is by three uh, long um, potentiometric displacement sensors, so that's not very expensive to do, but it's very precise. And so the result um, measuring with such a device, you can see one example here. 
Um, it's three instruments that I measured there, Carlo Begonzi, Stradivarius 1727, and the very beautiful Montagnana 1729. And so having the, all the arching values um, in a high precision um, device, you can compare them. And of course, you can see beautiful differences. This is the longitudinal um, arching of the instrument. And, and then I usually measure six cross profiles, as, which is used uh, normal. And I think most of you also do it like that. Um, which is um, nice for documentation when, for example, you try to copy an instrument. This is one example of a Stradivarius uh, 1727, the cross profiles of the back plate. And um, of course, it's a lot to learn when you compare various or different Stradivarius instruments, um, which I had in the workshop, or different masters, and to find your own language of arching. Uh, for me, the most um, useful and, and most necessary um, acoustic tool uh, in my workshop is to measure the radiation of the instrument. So I see all the resonances of the instrument. Um, this helps a lot as a, a diagnostic tool um, of what you have done and what is the effect of something that you have changed on the instrument. So actually, my philosophy is to uh, do a lot of empirical changes you just to open the instrument again and do little changes and then measuring the resonance profile as you can see here um, the device um, as i do it is i think everybody knows it's known radiation measurement here another stradivarius which i had in the workshop 1721 and so this is the result when um, doing um, 36 measurements and make an average of the instrument around the instrument um, in 36 angles. Um, so here you see a comparison of one of my, uh, actually this Stradivarius is my favorite instrument from all instruments I know, um, which you can see with the red resonance profile, the transfer function of radiation um, in absolute values, um, um, pressure divided by force. Um, and uh, so the red is the Stradivarius and the blue one is certainly one of my best instruments made in 2017. Maybe every 20th instrument, I am I would say I'm successful <laughs> and I'm very happy that I still sell all the instruments and not only every 20th, but I love this one very much because it, it's very close to my um, to my favorite instrument, favorite Stradivarius. You see the Helmholtz resonance, which is a little stronger with the new instrument, the T1, the B1, and the gap in between, and um, the A formant resonances and the brilliant um, resonances. Actually, what is very helpful for me to analyze the resonances more in an uh, averaged way, um, in by averaging energetic averaging in third octave bands, so you you have a more smooth impression of the radiation of the instrument. So um, still in the the point the the weak lines are the normal uh, result, and um, the fat lines blue and um, yeah and red are the two instruments uh, by which are averaged. So you see the Helmholtz resonance, the two body resonances, the medium, the, the A form end resonances, which are very important. Um, if, if they are too high, you will never change the color of the instrument. It will be very vulgar and very uh, obvious. So they must not be higher than um, the body resonances and the brilliance resonances. And then here you see some differences between the Strat also and uh, the new instrument. So that's quite uh, important for me. Um, in every day's work, um, which is interesting for me, of course, is what happens when I make two instruments and I leave everything the same, very similar wood, uh, the same shape, but I change the arching. So this picture is just to give you an image between two instruments. And now these are two instruments which I have made and you see huge differences. The, the red one is a more broad Belchisu like arching, not too high. And the, the, um, and the red one and the black one is a more Amati-like where um, you put uh, the concave areas more towards um, um, into the plate. 
which is not the case with the LGSU. So there are huge differences in radiation only by change of arching. So this is just to give a little image about how um, crucial um, the arching is as a controlling parameter of the tone um, together with the thickness radiation, but arching shapes the character of the instrument. So this is maybe just one of the last slides. Um, one of my programs which I wrote uh, to calculate arching, actually I calculated more than 80,000 arching points and made shapes of the arching. Um, and I'm very, um, they are all calculated. I'm very convinced about um, cycloids and um, the cross um, arching are very immediate cycloids where the, um, the, 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 um, the wheel runs on a plane a surface and you get uh, the cross, pri cross profile cycloids. The longitudinal um, arching is very easy to, um, to calculate, um, which I found out when you uh, let the longitudinal cycloid run in another cycloid, in a cycloid shell. And by a lot of parameters, which I can type in Excel, you can play with those par parameters, with those two cycloids. And then by this, you get the longitudinal arching. The calculated result is the yellow line. And it's, well, uh, yes, um, it's better to see, is the yellow line. And the points, for example, it was just playing with those two curves, with the blue and with the green circuit. And the points are Guarneri del Chisu, um, um, which I measured the arching. And so you can create almost every arching um, and every type, like Amati or Del Chisu, everything, just with playing with two cycloids, um, which you let run against each other. And so here you see little differences. Um, it's only very little different, very little difference in the in the yellow and the in the green cycloid. And you see now the it comes very close to the Del Chisu just by playing. And this is the last slide, a private slide, just to say it's a great inspiration and love to have the sound of horses as inspiration for violin. So I think I in the meantime, uh, my love for horses is much greater than my love for violence, but violins still are beautiful and wonderful. But this one, he sounds really like a viola, and this is my own horse, which um, since several weeks um, he decided for me. And so we are together now. And this is my wife, and she also started riding because she felt my love for uh, horses. So that's all I wanted to say at this point. Maybe later in the evening I can show some more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, th thank you, Martin. Fascinating. Um, I, that's a very interesting idea about blending the two cycl cycloids. Could you just explain that a little more? You, if one is subtracted from the other or multiplied by another. I, I don't have a sense of what you were doing to get the longitudinal arching. You mean about the longitudinal arching? Yes, yes. It, it, yes, it's just by uh, subtracting one from the other. So, so you, um, you create two cycloids and you subtract the value of the one from the other. That's why this goes down and the other goes up and the result is the longitudinal arching. And you can ah. create back plate and the top plate, everything. You can even create such an arching as the old instruments when the, when the um, bridge presses down. So it's just by playing with two numbers, you have to decide with the green cycloid, uh, the shell, where it starts and how deep it goes and to put the other cycloid on, onto the green shell. So it's actually, um, you can create the, the cycloids just manually when you have a, a round wheel and put your pencil into the wheel and then you let it run on a plain uh, table for, or pl uh, on the plain area. But of course you can let run this wheel also on such a shape. And this is what I did. And then you get the longitudinal arching of the top plate and of the back plate. So I'm quite okay. convinced everything is cycloids, and that's, of course, the old Greeks, they used it as it's the most beautiful shape you can do. And um, so uh, in the 17th century, it was the first time that the math mathematicians found the formula. So it was, they used it for 2000 years, but it, they didn't know the mathematical formula, but it, um, it's a, um, it's a, 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 a quite easy formula, which I think Leibniz was the one who found it.
Mm -hmm. And, and it's all put into Excel, and then you can calculate everything with Excel. Okay. And in the slide where you you say the only difference was the arching, these are two different violins made from the same wood, or yes, they are what, what? quite similar woods which are used. And my and I don't I only uh, always use the same model since two thousand and five. So it's the same. Still, of course, it's not a very precise experiment. It was not meant to to check the arching. It, it was just I used similar wood, and I had just by joining, I thought now this time I go into more Amati-like mm -hmm. arching, which I not do very often. Most of my archings are more Del Chisu. So your, your sense is that's representative of the sort of change you get by changing the arching. Yes, yes. And can you can you summarize what we saw in that radiation profile? Yeah. Um, I, I can't remember it. There's a little more energy. In... The, the, the Del Chisu arching type is much stronger and more powerful in tone. And the other was more sweet. It's not just a, such a mighty instrument, but it's it, it's very sweet sounding instrument somehow. So were those um, radiativity curves, were they normalized then? Because they looked approximately um, uh, no, no, not normalized, absolute values. Okay, and the sweeter uh, one had... All, all the radiation measurements, also comparing Stradivarius with mine, it's always, it's never normalized. It's always, always absolute values. Okay, and I remember you, I think you wrote that you'd studied a number of Stradivarius and Guarneris and found that the Stradivarius concentrated their um, energy more in the middle of the spectrum and mm -hmm. the... Guarneri's towards the outside, and I found that with a with a study of a, um, um, a I think, um, I don't know, eight strads and fourteen Guarneri's, or the other way around, no, the other way mm -hmm. around. But then I looked at makers copies, strad copies, and Guarneri copies, and saw the same thing. And so I was very pleased that it corroborated or um, confirmed yours. But it makes me if we can show there's some general objective differences, and this is something I hope we get a sense of, I don't know really what the difference between Strad and Guarneri arching is. I haven't seen enough originals. I have a sense of Guarneri's being rounder in the longitudinal profile, but then you see Strad's that are that way, and you see Guarneri's that are remarkably flat that way. Um, if you could summarize it in a, in a sentence or two, what would you say is your impression of the differences? Well, my, my impression is that Guarneri didn't like the um, concave, too too much concave areas. Okay. And Stradivarius somehow it's it's more beautiful maybe it's it's more harmonic, but it's quite concave in certain parts. Okay, and then and longitudinally, um, is it is it flatter for Stradivarius or that's just a uh, false maybe impression? Maybe Sam can has more values about this. My impression is that generally they are a little less in height. But a little less at home. If Sam would agree. Okay. Yeah, um, I would. Uh, anyone else have questions for Martin? We can we can ask everyone questions afterwards. I just want well, some ideas are fresh to give people a chance to respond. Or... I have one question, if I can. You hear me? Please go Please. ahead. Yes. I, I I wonder about the uh, since you have this nice. Uh, 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 Precise measurement system. Do you see changes with the changes in the humidity in the air? I, I didn't measure this because it's so much work <laughs> that I was okay. a bit lazy to do to do too much too many measurements on my own instruments. That's quite lazy, uh, quite boring. So, do you control the humidity? Um, yes, with the um, um, humidity. What do you call them? Which uh, increases humidity in winter. So it's okay. always somewhere between 40 and 50% okay. humidity. Okay, thank you. Super, um, who, who's gonna talk next? I want to ask Martin one question. Um, it's fancy to see the, you use the two curtailed cycloid to generate the arching. I, I wonder where the, the second one, the, the green one come from. How, 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 how would you introduce that? Are you just look at the final result to use that to adjust so that you can subtract to get an ideal shape you want? Or is there something 
Uh, well, it was just um, just by chance somehow to find this out because for me it was not logical that um, they should have created their cross profiles by using cycloids and the longitudinal profile without cycloids. And so I thought, why should they change the idea? And so if you use two cycloids, you can create every longitudinal profile. And so this is just with my program, I can just play with the two cycloids and then you can decide which option you want to, to create. And so it's, it fits to Stradivarius the same as to, uh, to, uh, to Guanerius. It fits to all, even to Amati. You can just play with the two cycloids against each other. And how do you work? You would first uh, generate the, uh, I guess you print out the, the profile of the lung arch, then you would uh, make the plate to, to, to fit the curve you, you print out. Uh, I didn't understand the question. So my question is, do you generate the, the design, your, your cycloid, the final result first in computer, then you print it out then you you carve the, the your plates to to yes you can you can create templates by this um, I I, um, I used to work a lot with carbon fiber experiments where you had where you need a, a total aluminium a complete arching so I created a complete arching by Excel with eighty thousand arching points and if you want to tell the the people who um, who with a Big router machine who create uh, the negative arching in aluminium so that you with a membrane heating system you can create archings and um, of course you have to tell them not not only six cross profiles but you have to tell them many many points and so with my excel um, program i can create 80,000 arching heights of course i could create more but that's not necessary because there's a certain program which smooths the arching, so that all the 80,000 points, they smooth into each other. So after this, some kind you have the ideal arching, which is your idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And just so as a last, a last question for me anyway, um, do you, have you arrived at what you would call your own personal arching or a pair of personal archings even for Strad and Guarneri models? Yes. Somehow, yes, I, I have my arching, which for me is beautiful. And I think that's perfect. I don't change it too much. No matter what instrument you're making. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions for Martin or comments? Just uh, a question about you using cycloids. Had you thought about catenaries as an arching? It's an easier arching tool, I think, to measure a catenary. Uh, when you're making, so uh, I don't know whether you dealt with yeah, that. I, di I didn't try. Of I think there are many possibilities to do. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Fung, do you want to go next? Um, yes, I can. The uh, the arch for me is, of course, is a long journey uh, into the, the front. Yeah. Many years. I, there's no clue because at the school, we learned some, uh, some we didn't lo learn much uh, theories about arching, I mean, very confusing to me. Uh, after, after school, still very confusing. Um, but, uh, but then I, when I came to US, I was um, working with Greg. Um, he was talking about barrel shape, you know, making arch Italian. Arching, there's a so called barrel shape, and we had some chance to look at old Italian violins, casts. So the, the idea uh, is more clear to me. Um, yet, still, there's many un unanswered questions even today. Um, actually, for me, the most um, curious thing is, is the, the, the different, different arch shape of top and back. You know, I, I remember at the school years. The teacher taught you, oh, this is this is a back arch. You make this way, then comes to top, you make it this way. And I I just don't understand why this is supposed to be different. Um, then um, then um, some years ago, um, my brother actually found a little article from the old 
VSA journal, there's a simple article wrote by uh, uh, Bill Fulton, um, which is a pioneer in our trade. So uh, I never met him, um, but this article, um, he talked about his way to devise a, a how to construct a, a Kremlin's arching. Basically, he used a um, he defined a central part. Um, then, then to define the the long arch, then the the rest that you basically just in his term, I think it's called flat. My understanding is straight, which is flow out in straight lines to the edges. And I mod modified this method a little bit. Um, have have been using this method to to construct the arch for many years, about ten years or so at this point. So I'm really happy with it. So so um, I don't use any cycloid or catenary. Actually, I do use catenary. Re take reference from cat catenary lines for the back arch for the long arch. But the main I can show you for the main. Main two I use instead of Martin's uh, fancy jig, I use a, a plastic strip. This is uh, about 40 to 41 millimeter. Uh, so this will, I, I'm, I mean, you can draw it on the plate, but it's much easier to use to make a tool. So you can place um, your plate and draw the two parallel lines. So this is the middle of the arch. Um, then I the, the only arching template that I use is something like this, which this is a two template. So so um, one radius is here, uh, another slightly different here. So I will only use this radius, given radius, to design the nearest point. At nearest the point, what radius <coughs> I want. Um, this is both true for top and the back. And um, then, out, then the, the outside basically in Fulton's idea just go straight, which I find for the most part, that's true. Um, it's not you know, as straight as um, straight edge, but, the, but visually it's very straight. Um, I find this way is, it's, you know, it's a bench, workbench approach, um, not much science involved, but I find I can Basically, divide the arch in 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 two zones. You know, the middle middle part, then the two sides um, just flow out. So in this way, it's it's um, it's much approachable. And for me, I was talking to Andrew not long ago. For me, the the question regarding arch is always the, why the difference between the top and back, and also the 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 long arch, the longitudinal arch of the top. I find that is, is no good answer. We have to somehow compromise here and there to uh, hopefully everything will come out good. Uh, could I ask you to clarify, when you say a straight line, you mean you get a straight edge and lay it on the arch in a certain direction. Could you just demonstrate that? Um, Basically, um, you know, let me uh, show me my uh, computer. There's a, there's a, just give me one second. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. This is a uh, this is a drawing by Fulton. You can see the middle part is the middle section. What interesting is the the kind of radiate from it towards side toward the upper bout and lower bout. He called this uh, I think he called this flat. So basically, if you use plane or scrapers to to connect the middle part to the 
edge and there should be not much curve you know, curve out over there. Um, but this, this is not literally straight, rather you know, on real violin there isn't. The arches are, I don't think they're as straight. They're all uh, round. Frank, Frank can, uh, can I add something? Yes, please. Uh, okay. Can I, uh, those two parallel lines from Fulton, which I've been doing from the beginning, uh, they are more or less uh, uh, placed like you would place the base bar, just about the base bar and it's symmetric on one side and the other one. So right. they follow more or less the end of the base bar. Right. And, and if you want to divide those end of the thing, you take the Sacconi well, division, the way he taught to divide uh, the the width of the upper bar, the width of the lower bar by uh, 14, and you know, the way you said the bar, uh, base bar. So more or less it follows the base bar, just about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually use the parallel, the middle section, more or less parallel, same width, width disregard base bar. But, but in the end, um, I do blend everything together. So on the real violin, you sort of see this structure, but it's not very obvious um, because on the violin, you know, there's no no ridge, no ridge between the, the middle section to the to the to the height, the, the top area. Does this apply to the top and the back? Yes. Um, the the real question is, um, how should I stop this? Go back to um, go back to share a screen. I oh think. yeah, stop share. Yeah, for me the I think this both uh, applies to top and the back. Um, for me, the 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 interesting part of making arching is rather to design the long arch, which is the almost the beginning. I mean, I, I would first you define the edge, then you give a arching height, you see it's a 15 or 15.5 or whatever height, then, then the hardest question comes is what the profile you want this long arch to be. Um, uh, for the back, I use, I actually take reference from cutinary lines. I do have a, a thin chain, the same length as the, uh, the plate, about 356. So I hang on the, on the piece of board. I can visualize this the the curve it 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 dangles there, which I think can be used on the back long arch uh, rather easily. Um, the, towards the two ends is kind of more straight, is more curved in the mid middle, very small amount. But for the top, it's totally another story. Um, I I don't. Um, I do have actually. I have a hypothesis. I think it's possible that 300 years ago, the, the the Italian makers might even construct the top arch, the long arch, same as the back. I wonder if anyone else um, have this concept because the uh, as as a modern maker, we have a dilemma because when when we make long arch for the for the top, uh, you know, there's a, three sections, and we all know the Italian violins, these tops are deformed. Different violin deform different amount. When you, when you look at some well-preserved Strad uh, violins, the side view, you can, you can tell that the, there is a minimum deformation on the spruce, so which almost indicate the long arch of the top is is it possible it's just they don't differentiate the two two arches? I don't know. It's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So I, that, uh, yeah, I've wondered. I, I think there there is a difference, but um, I, I completely agree that the distortion in the long run affects essentially makes. Uh, if you made it an originally with a back arch, you'd end up getting towards what we think of as a um, a, a modern longitudinal arch, which is a bit flatter in the middle. So, right. Um, so, so as a new maker, as, as a as a living maker, we can we have to sort of compromise somewhere in between. We want to create the top arch, this three section arch, so that the middle part is more straight. I think that's facilitate the certain vibration 
But uh, if we copy the old archings too much, um, after two or 300 years, our top arch will be deformed out of shape. Um, I don't know, can be, it can be. Um, so anyway, your, your straight lines you're using figuratively, it's sort of a workshop sense. That's right, okay. yes. Okay. That, that's what I wanted to know. Yes. Um, anyone have any questions for Fung? Shall we move on then to... Um, um, Andrew. Uh, yeah, because uh, I think he's got some uh, similar notions about where you can get straight lines out of archings. Andrew, are you ready to go? Uh, Joe, uh, if I may add one quick thing to Frank's. Uh, related to the subject that he started showing the parallel lines, uh, we did some work at Oberlin and uh, Steve Sir published it in the uh, uh, Strad magazine where you can see the, well, there are uh, more or less straight lines to the F hole, but then they bulge out a, a little. And that area in between, uh, it's always, a, it has a certain radius, exact uh, section of a circle. Of course, as you go up and down, that uh, radius of the circle varies. If anybody is interested, you can look at that article by Steve Sor in the Strat Magazine. We worked it out at Oberlin and it's related to that. Okay. I think Andrew's ready. Uh, unmute yourself, Andrew. Sure, how do I share my screen? You can go ahead. You, um, you're a co-host. I made you a co-host, so, so you can share your screen. Okay. How do I do that? Though? What button do I press? That's the question. Uh, There's a green the button in the lower middle part. It says share screen, green, lower. Oh, there we go. Share content. All right. Uh, start podcast. All right, uh, split. So um, uh, a few thoughts on, uh, are they there? Are you still here? Sorry. Uh, Is there, uh -huh. Do you have a slide or something you, you want to share, Andrew? I wanted to, but I'm, I'm not quite sure how to do it. Let me, let me just talk for a minute and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Um, you can hear me fine, right? Yep. Uh, so for me, the arching, uh, there, there are a few different um, problems to solve. Um, obviously, there's, inter there's a de interdependence of the materials, the arching, the graduation um, that you identified in your little synopsis of, of what the, today's discussion was. Um, each of those needs to be uh, in accord for the instrument to be successful, obviously. Um, faults in the arching or faults in response to the materials, which are expressed in the arching or in the graduations, uh, where one is trying to compensate for a fault in the other. Um, this is where it leads to problems in the in the sound, I think. So, for me, arching is this, is principally a materials problem. So, identifying the um, the qualities of the material, meaning how stiff is the material, essentially, um, and then building the arch around a response to that. Um, judging materials is um, let me see if I can pull this up now. Uh, split view, see if, if, if this share content. Okay, photos. All right. Give me a wrong direction. Um, so uh, this is a, okay. So, um, if, if you look at materials, um, most people assume if you follow density, 
um, that you're going to, that that is a, a shorthand for the stiffness of the material. Um, but if you actually look at that, um, density is a poor, uh, this, this diagram over here, I don't know if people see this one on the right-hand side. Um, that's the uh, density, and then the line is the regression for density and stiffness. So on the bottom, we have the density. Going up the side, we have the static uh, modulus of elasticity or the, the deflection of the material. Um, so if you're using density as a substitute for you, the stiffness of material, you're not getting very close to what um, is an accurate measure. Um, if we look at the speed of sound, the regression is a little bit better. Let me see if I can pull that up here. Um, let's see. So there's speed of sound on the right. So the regression is uh, a little Andrew, bit better. Andrew, yeah. um, it's not changing because I actually. All right. Uh, yeah, let's see if this does it. Uh, Let's see, share content, photos. Let's see if this one is Andrew, share all three. Tell there it to go. share your desktop, then, then it'll mirror whatever you're seeing. Okay. Share content. Just screen. Yeah, try that. Just a desktop rather than some particular window. Then it should just follow whatever you're seeing on your screen. Is that coming up now? Let's see. I'm sorry that this is difficult. Um, Yeah, we just see this. Uh, hmm. Sorry. Oh, wait. Here we go. Uh, well, I don't see know. Well, we see something, but we see right, your well, let's get okay. that. I'm just going to talk then. Yeah, um, just talk. That, that was an improvement <laughs> so, because that was we... the last of the <laughs> The other one and the first one wasn't the chart you were talking about. So that actually was an improvement, that last one. All right. It, 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 it doesn't matter. Um, What's important is that if you follow the regression of the speed of sound, it's a better, more accurate judgment of the of the uh, stiffness. If you combine the speed of sound and the density, um, you get a very, very good regression. Um, so I think identifying the proper stiffness of the materials uh, is the first problem. Um, and you can easily uh, just make a graph of of the stiffness of the materials. The materials that have the same modulus of elasticity, even if they have very differing densities or speeds of sound, uh, will have the same stiffness, the same deflection. Um, they'll behave differently when you start to graduate them. Um, you'll need to leave them different thicknesses based on the densities. But uh, uh, I find that if the arching is not the correct height for the materials, you run into significant problems along the way. Um, the next thing that, that you were asking about was the straight lines. Um, let's see. So the, the, the straight lines, um, I wrote an article recently for the Strad about this, um, but essentially the, um, the straight lines uh, uh, Sam and I had a discussion recently about identifying, how do you identify the complex shape of an arch? Um, so we know the height, you probably know the thickness at the channel. Um, there are some curves, there are some radiuses. So we talked about the central area that has a radius. Um, we know the longitudinal arch, we could identify a few points along there. Um, I think if you think about the arch as a slope, Think about more about the slope of the arching. Um, you can capture a lot of information as how it goes from the top to the bottom. Um, uh, what else is there to say about it? Um, 
I think wood is essentially a very sloppy material um, or very tolerant, we'll say. So violins, because they have a certain amount of thickness, um, we can talk about uh, precision of you know, 18,000 points or something like that. We don't need to be that precise in the arching actually because the material itself has a thickness, the lines of force travel through the instruments um, sort of somewhere between the, you know, the top, the outside surface and the inside surface. There's a certain amount of give there um, that is tolerant. Um, what else? Um, I don't know, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think it might, it might be easiest to shift. So here's, here's a, uh, just a fiddle in the white to talk about the straight line stuff. Um, so if you, you can actually place a, a sort of straight edge onto the arching at certain points in the arching. Um, and this is this, this flat area is the transition from the concave to the convex in the arching. Um, and there'll be certain points so that essentially you've got here, you've got here, you've got here, 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 and here. Um, that defines a lot of the arching. You can, you can really um, categorize the shape quite, quite a bit. If you know the radius here, you know how high the arch is here, how high the arch is here, and what the thickness at the channel is. Um, this slope, how much this slopes will define how full the arching is. Um, so I think within sort of 20 points, you could define an arch quite accurately um, for the practical purposes of making violins um, as far as you know theoretically or like uh, understanding them as a finite element or things like that I don't know but it, just making violins that seems a pretty um, pretty easy way same thing exists in the top you can find these points um, I referenced the article people um, want to understand it more um, one other thing about the uh, the materials. Um, if you have two arches that are the same, but of different materials, um, but they have the same modulus of elasticity, the materials have the same modulus, um, and the arches are the same identical, they will have the same frequency. Like if you actually tap the arch, uh, the ungraduated arch, they will have the same frequency. So the frequency is sort of a shorthand for the modulus. Um, so you could actually tune arches uh, from different materials. If they tune the same, they will have the same stiffness. Does that make sense? Am I explaining that well? Um, if, I, I'm not sure that I understand. Um, maybe we could back up a step. You say the arching is depending on the materials stiffness or, or it sounds like the radiation ratio is the, the speed of sound divided by density is what you think of as most accurate. How would you change the arching for let's say a very low radiation ratio versus a very high one? Um, you have two, two pieces of wood or we have a piece of wood. We measure the density, we measure the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. um, so we, if we square the speed of sound and multiply it by the density, that's the modulus of elasticity to me. Uh, and according to the to the industry, like to, according to the wood industry, that would be an accurate measure of its actual deflection. Like if you put a weight on it, you had a batten, and you put a weight on it, the deflection um, would be the same if you had two pieces of wood with the same modulus, but they had very differing um, uh, densities and speeds of sound. As long as they have the same modulus, they will have the same deflection. Okay, but without getting into the to the weeds of how you measure it, um, weaker wood would you make higher arching? I mean, is there yes. some generalization? Yeah. Ah, exactly. okay, yeah. So, and if you had, uh, say, you wanted to make the same arch or the an arch of the same stiffness, essentially, or in the right same ballpark, we'll say, of stiffness, 
but you're using different materials each time. If you tune them to the same frequency, they will be relatively in the same vicinity of stiffness. Um, I'll, I'll leave it as, because obviously the archings will be slightly different shapes now, but if their frequencies are the same, even if they're more, this is how you can make, you know, very different pieces of wood behave similarly um, before you start graduating them. Um, so using the arching, you can get similar stiffness to mass ratios with different bits of wood, I, I think is- the Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now you can get those pieces, different pieces of wood to behave similarly when they're actually finished, when the, the box is all closed and everything that you can get the, the basically the modes in similar places. Okay. And do you, um, do you flex the wood? Do you flex the arching? Is that one of the ways you, you judge or, or for graduation? No. No, I never flex, <laughs> flex the wood. Um, uh, through the through the whole uh, process, you don't flex it. Through the whole process, I mean, it, 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 only out of idle curiosity. <laughs> um, oh, I, that's I, I, interesting. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I, 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 tend, I, I go ahead. I tend toward more measuring uh, mass and measuring stiffness through frequency, um, and looking at the looking at those two elements and trying to get them to work together so that the uh, um, whichever one I feel is the father out, I alter the structure accordingly, either work on the arching some more or work on the graduations in specific ways to reduce either mass or reduce stiffness faster. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And um, then Fung, do you flex your plates when you're arching or graduating? Mm -hmm. No? No. Ah. I mean, I I flex it when I when I do graduation, uh, when that arching session. No. Okay, so just for graduations. Yes. Okay. And um, um, okay, fascinating. A a anything else to add, Brian, to to your thoughts here? Um, for me, it's that making is a totally materials property issue it's like understanding the materials and how to respond to the material um, uh, through correct arch height and principally for me the arch height is a is a huge part of it um, though we were talking about the arch shapes so how do you categorize those different shapes so basically you have you know arches that have shallow slopes so like a stradivari you were asking like what's the difference between the stradivari and the gray like principally for me is in that cross arch of the sea bout a stradivari is quite square it's quite flat and sort of goes and then drops or it's you know anywhere from like a nice roundness to something that is a little like that where it drops quickly from outside the f-holes down whereas a, a granary for me is much more peaked the, the, there's a, a, a more definite spine and then a, a, a sort of more roofed top kind of slope away from there. Um, so that, you're saying, if I understand you right, that with Stradivari, let's say there was a curve there, he breaks the curve and cheats a bit where the F holes are so he can get yeah, flatter yeah. and that get, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's more, you know, it's, it's more a radius, uh, and maybe in a granary, that radius is more it, more narrowly defined. And then from there on out, it, it does not, it, it has a, a straighter approach to the, uh, to the perfling or to the channel, which I think follows Martin's statement. They prefer something that's, that's straighter. Um, and I think this straightness in a, in a, in a granary is a feature. And, Sam, Sam and I met a few weeks ago and we were talking about this, about arching and how that shape may uh, actually rotate differently. Obviously, if you have a, um, I, I, this, this fiddle that I'm working right now is a, a sort of a Lake Guarneri and has those very pyramid shaped arch um, that the late instruments have. And I, I felt uncomfortable going to the extreme that say the Oli Bull or the Leduc is and trying to understand how that arch was functioning differently than a 
Stradivariards, which is very sort of plateau-like or, or flat. And they have very different, the crease and the arching is in very different places, we'll say. The, the, uh, in, a, in, a, in a Grunary, the, the, the crease area or the, uh, uh, the bending area seems to be in, in a flat. And the Stradivari puts the, the sort of uh, crease where the nodal line is, at least for the lowest modes, you know, for, the, for the body modes, for the B1 modes. Um, so those have to function very, very differently. Um, but I would say that like, if I had to think about what the difference is between those two, two makers, that would be a kind of fundamental. Maybe that's a very important point. Um, Shape the problems, it's a material problem. Uh, I can't hear you, sorry, Martin. Oh yes, maybe what you just say uh, is a very important point and it uh, fits to something which Oliver Radke just posted in the chat that um, about the acoustic idea of the arching, maybe we should talk more about this also because as a general idea, it's obvious that the idea of the arching is to create more stiffness with less weight. That's just the idea why we, why the violin makers um, used and made archings. And of course, acoustically, it is important to understand uh, the arching and the gradation and the wood properties as a unit. Um, only all those um, parameters together form the mass and stiffness distribution, which again creates all the resonances of the instrument. So of course, it's no use to discuss arching without wood properties and gradation. And this is where modal analysis comes into play, which is very helpful. Maybe I should add one slice um, um, because I only talked about radiation analysis, which shows the result, but modal analysis shows the reason for the result for the radiation. And with modal analysis, it's possible to, um, to understand arching and radiation and wood properties as a unit because what it creates is just the result of all the parameters together. Um, maybe I just can show you one slice with, which is quite um, interesting to see. Um, this one, do you see it on the screen? Yeah. Yes. yes. Because now this is normalized uh, because, um, Joseph, you asked with the radiation, I never, I never uh, normalize radiation, but this is, structure bond sound, it's not radiation, but it's the vibration amplitudes. So this is of course not uh, the arching, but it is just as one example for what, the, for the reason of the arching, which creates the eigenmodes of vibration. It shows normalized all to one, um, the um, B1, which is the main body resonance, you know, the, the second peak of the big body resonance is the B1 resonance of, uh, four violins, a wonderful Bergonzi, Montagnanas. <coughs> this is another Stradivarius 1712, not the ones, not the two ones I showed before. This is the one actually which Pinchas Zuckerman used to play it for many, many years. And one uh, instrument which I made many years ago. And here you see um, the, um, the, <laughs> the ratio of vibration amplitude of the lower bout, which is the, the maximum width of the lower bout is here and the maximum width of the upper bout is here. The, the bridge is, um, is here um, in this location. So this is the length of the violin and the vibrations of the V1 mode normalized to one. And so here actually we can see that the Stradivarius um, and the Bergonzi are really, and um, the Bergonzi much more is really not a good idea. It's not a fantastic, combination of arching and thickness graduation. It's an expensive instrument, but not strong sounding, which means with the Bergonzi, you, you lose all the potential of the upper bout because it's too stiff. And you can only judge about the stiffness when you regard graduation, wood and arching at one as, as a unit. And you, you can reveal this unit by using modal analysis. So here you see, the Stradivarius, it's it's very strong vibration in the upper in the lower bout below and the in the lower part of the violin, but very little, only half or 0.6 of the of this um, in the upper bout. So which means the upper bout is 
even with this Stradivarius, the upper bout is too stiff compared to the lower bout, which is a result of the arching. And the Montagnana is wonderful. <laughs> this is for me as a good B1 mode and violin should be. So this means, do you see my, uh, my moving? Yes, we see yes, your- Okay, that's yeah. perfect. So you see the lower bout activity and the, and the upper bout activity, they are about the same, which means use all the whole plate vibration for the B1 mode. And the B1 mode mm -hmm. is something like a parameter for many other modes. So if you analyze the B1 mode and you find this, immediately you see the arching is too stiff, too long in the upper bout and too thick in radiation. So this should be, re you should not make an instrument like the Bergonzi. And so you see the Stradivar this one actually was a copy of a Montagnana. This was a time where I hadn't developed my own model. So I tried to come closer to the Montagnana. Still, I should have opened it again um, and re-graduated. Um, it was because I would say it's not a good idea to have um, um, not enough vibration energy in the upper bound. So mode analysis, which is the result of those four instruments, I made modal analysis on those four instruments. It reveals if the arching works together with the, with the gradation and the wood properties. So Martin, so I understand you. Well, well first of all, um, those lines represent the averaged um, velocity or something across the whole plate at each point on- No, the... not, not, not the average, but um, along the long, uh, just on the, on the center line. Oh, right on the center line. Right on the center line, because the V1 node has a nodal has nodal, nodal lines like this, so it's just a, 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 like cutting through the center line. It shows the vibration. The V1 node vibration is like this, um, it, and in the center line, you see if something like this happens, it means it vibrates like this only, and this is dead. So it has a dead up about, and, and so. What, what arching is it so we can avoid it? Or is it partly the base bar as well? Um, well, it's, it's, um, it's, I think a base bar is one, is, is one reason, certainly. The base bar might be too stiff here, might be, had, had been different uh, before. So it's, it's just all together, the base bar, the arching, then the thickness. So the arching is nothing specially unusual. No, um, and we, I think we always must keep in mind that the upper bout really is much stiffer in general because it's, it's less, it less, has le less width. And so the upper bout has to be more flexible because it's much less width than the, than the lower bout in general. And sometimes if we regard upper bout and lower bout, bout almost the same, it's a mistake because the upper bout is much stiffer. It's like a small instrument in the upper bout and a big instrument in the lower bout. Fascinating. Um, this, is, this is just one example because so, sometimes yeah, before- Would, would you I make the, ask, Martin? Yeah? Would you make the upper bout uh, thinner than the lower bout then? Yes, ten, in, with, in tendency, yes. Yes, to, to get a more um, unique, and wider um, um, radiation potential. Yeah. Okay. Thank and, you very and much. So this was it's just one example because some talks before, also with uh, George Stopani, sometimes I was asked why do you use modal analysis. So this is one reason, of course, for why it's sensible to use modal analysis and not only radiation analysis. And you would say that the um, the um, Berganzi just wasn't a very good sounding instrument overall. And not, it was not powerful. It was quite ah. weak, small sounding. Still, oh, okay. it can have quality. You can still say, well, that has a nice quality. It's attractive. It's touching you, but it's not a solistic instrument. Okay. Um, Andrew, have you, have you, did we finish up or any more questions for Andrew? Uh, I, I, I want to uh, say thank you, Martin. That's a, that's a yes. fabulous graph. Um, very, very useful. And I think this idea of the unity of graduation materials arching um, is a fundamental principle um, and that we can use it. I don't think, um, as you said, it, it takes a long time to take these measurements and, and uh, some makers don't have time for that. But I think a lot can be done with very simple means 
to get a picture of things like even just um, you know, a, a simple radiation uh, graph of a particular instrument, you can already see mm -hmm. how certain things are behaving and respond. Like you say, take an instrument apart and do a little bit of work to make something work better. Um, you can learn a lot from doing that. And uh, it doesn't take, a, um, it takes a little effort. You don't have to go uh, as deeply into it as, as you have in, in, I, in many of this. And I, I still think it's, it's quite intuitive and easy to avoid those mistakes because if you yeah. radiate your top plate and you have the top plate in hand and you, you hear like this, you hear the no, you, you, you listen to the noise on the lower bout and then you listen to the noise on the upper bout. And you say, "Wow, this is really, it's 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 yeah. resonating." And I don't really, it's it's not not really resonating up there. So it's very. I think I'm sure it's 300 years ago they touched their plates and knocking to the fifth mode. Of course, you can say, "How much force do I need here to knock the fifth mode? And how much do I need yeah. here?" To, and so it's not only the eigen mode, the tone which you hear, but also the amount of ah, that's not that's not living. That's that's dead. Ah, that's that's really alive, and now ah, it's, it's it's decaying too 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 early. So you you only need your fingers, but you yeah. you need to understand that you touch your plate at different parts, and you hear the and not only the noise and not only the tones the tap tones, but also the noise when when going like this to the plate. How active it is! Um, I, I I also wanted to say one thing about tonal ideals. So uh, recently I've uh, been listening to Heinrich Schering and Arthur Grumio probably about as far apart in a sort of tonal ideal. Um, if so, sort of, I, I think of Heinrich Schering as the epitome of the Guarneri sound, kind of almost viola-like, the Leduc is almost viola-like sounding, um, little covered, very dense, he really pushes the sound out of the violin. Whereas Arthur Grumio and his Stradivari is, for me, the epitome of a, a Stradivari sound that very free. You just touch it and it and it's released. It goes. Um. So I think it's <laughs> this uh, sense of having some tonal ideal or some you know th this is you know if we if we talk about what we're trying to shape, we're also trying to shape the sound. And what is the sound that we're trying to shape? And we we need to go from the materials to the, the to the tone and uh, connect those two points. So there is not necessarily one solution. There is there are multiple solutions in in tone that it isn't just uh, a maximal thing. It's a it's a it's a more subtle thing than that. But I also uh, uh, I, I I'll say one more thing. Um, uh, I was listening to. Um, Milstein interview, and he says it's very difficult to be complicated. That was a quote from Milstein. So I tend to try to keep it very simple. Okay, try to keep things simple, and in the analysis, look at things in broad views. Try to get a handle on the um, the biggest picture you can. Anyways, that's all. I've taken up more time than anybody. I apologize. Not at all. That was very good. Thank you. Andrew, so let I'm um, uh, respecting Sam's wish to go last. Let me just, uh, uh, Joseph, but we have uh, two people that have had their hands up. Um, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, George. Yeah, um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up uh, from where Martin Schleska was about the amplitudes along the center line. Uh, some of you would be aware of the experiment we did in Oberlin in 2000. And uh, 19, where we took uh, some pl um, top plates and we thinned them in uh, the upper bout, the island area and the lower bout. And what we found is when we looked at them in the pinned edge rig, changing the thickness of the upper bout had very, very little effect at all on the, on the frequency and amplitude of the first uh, sort of, well, over the whole entire frequency range, actually, that you could measure that way. We did the experiment again, this time with Bax in uh, V for Vard uh, in October that year. And we found the opposite. We found that the uh, sea bout area and the lower bout were far more insensitive than you'd imagine. But the thing that made the difference was the uh, upper bout. 
And this, uh, well, last year, uh, 22, in, in that v, the V for Viol workshop, we made four violins where we started out with them all quite thick plates, and then we thinned in some the upper bout and in some the lower bout in the island at the top. In others, it was the upper bout of the back. So, so we had the four possible combinations there. And this rather backed it up that the by uh, when we first started out, one of the violins was in the bottom two in terms of amplitude. But after that, uh, after those graduation things, the one where we thinned the lower bout an island off the top and the upper bout of the back was way louder. Very, very substantial by like nine decibels or something like that. Really big. And it, this was borne out by this was borne out by results from the Boeing machine. There's very, very large differences. So what but what I would say is that the, the those plots that Martin was showing, I think you find if you took a very large number of violins, the vast majority of them would have greater amplitude in the lower about an island and less in the top. That's simply because of the way the f holes are cut to detach that area and it naturally moves. And you also see that in the find out element models that that area is moving. So in, in my opinion and still, still limited experience of this, I, I would say that making that upper bout come in and really play its part in the lower frequency modes is quite difficult. I mean, they're going to be some factors that help. I mean, one, for example, I think is the width of the upper eyes of the F-holes. And the narrower those are, the more they decouple the island and lower bout from the upper bout. So wider F-holes, uh, I think a discontinuity in thickness there is going to make it worse, particularly a thin area or just a shelf across there is likely to reflect waves back rather than transmit them through that little, little harbour mouth. And also the uh, profile of the base bar. So if you drop the base bar height too soon, I think you'll probably also have some loss there. But uh, it, believe me, this is quite surprising when you see that. And it's, it's, um, it, but it's also heartening to see in a structural experiment how, how the results uh, correspond to what you would predict from previous experiments. Very interesting. Uh, but then the arch, so is it is it the, you know, presumably you'd make the upper bout less stiff by making the arching lower for the upper bout. We're not sure if that's what you want. But we've only really been talking about uh, longitudinal stiffness and properties of the wood, whereas for spruce, I think the transverse stiffness is uh, very important. It may not be the thing that you judge you would buy when you're buying it, but when you build the instrument, uh, tiny things there like you know the, how much is off the quarter and how unlucky you are with that off quarter cut uh, lining up with the um, uh, steep slope of the arching you know you can have your um, uh, annual rings at quite a big angle to the surface and, and then a very big drop in transverse stiffness and that's what possibly one of the reasons why it's so difficult to make two identical violins is that that is a that is a very difficult parameter to control mm -hmm. thank you jonas yeah so uh, i have a general comment and I'm sorry if I'm skipping the line here, but I have to get back to my violin making school soon. So um, anyways, so I think like an idea to understand the effect of arching could be, as I understand it, um, the arching, the, the, the significance of the arching is where it has the most curvature, right? Because it is a curvature that 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 uh, gives the stiffness right and so i'm thinking like if you already have a program like Mar martin has that has where he has like the entire surface mapped out it would be fairly straightforward to calculate the curvature like basically making a curvature map of your arching profile uh, like the second derivative or something like that and then um, if you already have an idea like what shape do you want of the eigenmodes like maybe you want to increase the radiation of a given eigenmode well then you be you better m make an arching that doesn't introduce too much stiffness where that eigenmode has a lot of bending right so this is this is just an idea how how to actually try to experiment a little bit with like an easy way to understand what effect does a particular arching have like to make a kind of uh, stiffness map 
using the curvature. So that, yeah, that was just my comment. Very interesting, thank you. Um, Colin? You're muted, Colin. All right. Uh, just just to confirm what everyone is saying recently, um, uh, Martin, join us now. The important thing about arching is is um, one its height, um, <clears throat> but the other thing is uh, is its curvature and how the curvature in two dimensions changes across the surface of the plate. And essentially, what happens is that the curvature um, um, starts to bring in longitudinal waves, basically, and increases the effective stiffness um, of the local bending. And um, Martin's some beautiful slide was very interesting because exactly as Joseph was saying, I think <laughs> if you mapped the the bending along the length of the or the curvature rather across along the length you would see a, a rather strong correlation with uh, <clears throat> um, the, the amplitudes of the B1 minus, B, B1 minus mode. So uh, all, all I want to say at this stage is um, uh, a lot of senses coming up. I agree entirely from a scientific point of view. Very glad to hear it. Um, so shall I show a couple of slides? Um, Okay, looks good. All right. So, um, I, I just the basic tools that I use are being arching height. A, um, a a height gauge is a great thing to have. Um, it's great for a lot of things, um, but often I will just fix it at the arching height I want, and then when I'm roughing it down, just go slide it underneath. I usually work between fifteen and and, and seventeen. Um, I remember back in the old days copying um, old violins, a lot of the old archings were quite high, 17, 18, 19, mostly because they were puffed out a lot, I think, over time. Um, and th that gets back to one of the things that, that Fung was saying about distortion and what are we really copying, where, what are we really idealizing? Anyway, basic tools, I use that, and I use a, a flexible ruler, which creates um, essentially a spline. Um, which is, of course, how a lot of um, CAD modeling works. It's one of the tools besides circles. Um, it's the curve created by a, a an evenly flexible material. And so really, I, I've it's, it's not a particularly sophisticated approach, but I've always worked by eye a lot. I feel if I get the height where I wanted, and then I run a ruler up and down, and it, it's it's very good. It shows whether it's symmetrical or not. And if you can see light under it on one side versus the other, um, it, um, it, it sort of normalizes itself to the shape and shows the deviation very nicely. And if you're working from a cast, you can do the same thing on the cast. And I found that the, the spline created by a flexible ruler actually fits most of the kind of curvaceous areas of the Italians that I've copied. Um, and it, um, in recent years, working with... Um, um you know fusion with designing instruments um by means of 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 splines and things um where usually you want you know the simplest the simplest possible curve to work rather than patching a lot together to produce a a, a curve um so in a sense the the cycloid that martin was talking about was a simple curve a spline like this is a simple curve. Which ones apply in which case is, of course, a matter of, of what kind of arching you're trying to do. Um, this is relatively recent for me. I was thinking a lot about arching after doing a, a talk on um, um, how archings distort. And um, I um, was talking to Sam, and he, he, he uses a, um, a, um, just a, a radius for right above the F holes. And um, so I thought I'd try that. And I'd been working with the arch with a um model that had that particular one had worked particularly well. 
and I happen to have paid attention to that, and it's fit a 97 um, millimeter um, radius. And I heard, um, who gave the talk? Andres Hudelmeyer um, was talking about how they um, just normalized the arching under the bridge to make it more convenient to fit with 110 millimeters. So I made one of those as a reference. And I'm not saying my arching is conform to these all the time, but they're in the ballpark. So it's used to have useful to have them around to, to sort of plunk on top. Um, um, so th those are really the, 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 the things I, I do. I haven't, I, I do rely on my eye a lot, which has some advantages and, and some disadvantages. Um, so, and, and one of the disadvantages is you can kind of go off on your own path. So it is, it is good periodically to try and get some objective measures like, like templates and casts and things around. Um, well, we've talked about that some, let me just, okay. So this is one of my favorite photographs of a, um, of Yola and the, and the gross distortions in the back. Um, it's a lovely object and, but it's really what, time tends to do to wood and, and to um, archings. And um, so I just wanted to show a couple of shots from the, the talk I did some months back on um, distortion. We, we all know how they distort. Um, and this sort of shows what Fung was saying. If you if you put a you know string tension on an instrument on a top, even if it started out like the back, it's gonna head towards the um, our current arching and beyond, unfortunately. And um, I've had, um, so I've, a lot of my thinking about arching now is how can we prevent um, long-term defamation? I've seen instruments that I've made over the past, gosh, um, it's almost 40 years now, um, including ones with some very light woods that didn't distort at all, at least, I mean, they must have distorted, distorted some, um, but it, the, the arching still looked very healthy to me. Um, these all had longitudinal arching archings with a good bit of, of, of curve in them. I had a couple of instruments which started off as copies of, of, of strads, which were almost flat. Um, and one in particular, I, I, I'm about to make a new top for. It was a beautiful instrument. It was sort of a breakthrough instrument in some ways for me in terms of sound, but um, it, it just kept going. And um, I, <laughs> I was alerted to this. A client called up and said, you know, could you write on the certificate that you built it to match, you know, as a copy of the Strad, including the, including the deformations, so that someone doesn't come and try and, you know, change them back eventually. And I thought, well, you know, I better have a look at this instrument. <laughs> and it was clear that the archings had gone well beyond. Um, and so that's made me very shy of getting close to where a lot of the old Italians are now. Um, um, that's a nice shot where, where we see what happens to the back. Um, regarding um, Fung's question, what's, what's the difference in rationale between the, the back and the top arching? I think that, to my mind, we have to divide between what I think of as the static functions of the arching, which is to hold the tension, and the dynamic ones, which are to vibrate. And the, the stiffness created by the arching on the top and on the back will stiffen the wood dynamically. In other words, the waves will travel more quickly through them. But when you have the force coming down on the top, the archings in the right direction, when it's going down on the back, it weakens the instrument in that direction. So it makes perfect sense to me that back arching should be a little flatter than top archings. I mean, they should be completely flat if we were just trying to resist deformation or even going in the other way. But of course, that does the wrong things for dynamic behavior. Um, but this was a, this was um, measurements by um, Harris, um, Nigel Harris transferred onto a, um, a, a CT scan um, just to show what happens when you load up the instrument or one particular instrument. But this seems to be typical for some other, um, from some other studies I've seen where we see really a couple of tenths, two to three tenths of distortion in the top. Um, so, I've always kind of made my instruments a bit asymmetrical, kind of trying to reverse that. And recently having thought about it a bit, I, I do it maybe a little more intelligently where, where is it gonna go down for sure? Where is it gonna get pushed up? 
kind of tweak it a bit the other way. And doing this means that, of course, no cycloid or spline is going to fit. It, it's just as simple as that, um, which doesn't bother me at all. I think that um, the you know the Renaissance 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 look of, of beauty and symmetry definitely inspired instruments, but the the function and the acoustics are definitely asymmetrical and not related to that. And I would be surprised if someone like Sean Hardesty, who's interested in optimization, were to be able to optimize the structure for particular in particular ways. We don't know what the best violin, or we don't know enough in any direction to say what would be the best. But I doubt very much it would come out as a symmetrical classical arching. I don't think that the deviations would be great, but I think there would be some. And I, I'd be very curious to know what they are. And I'd be especially curious if, if people will do more work with FEA modeling to say, okay, if we lower the arching, you know, um, a millimeter or two millimeters, what, what's, what's going to happen in general? Let's get some general answers. Um, and particularly to the longitudinal profile, um, uh, there's, there's, there, I have a cast of a, a late Guarneri where I, I swear that the, the arching longitudinally is, is bold even for the back of an instrument. It's, 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 it's really um, quite curved. But um, I don't think I would. Well, well, I, I think the trouble is if you try and copy an old Italian instrument. A lot of them, I mean, yep, what you have to worry about is succeeding. I, 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 you know, a lot of them don't sound very good. So if you make detailed copies, it's it's um, not the way to go. Um, so let me see. This was another this was another study um, of the of the Paganese instrument and how it deforms when you string it up. Um, so I, I I try and overlay those on my sort of um, internalized sense of beautiful classical arching when I'm working and 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 in, in a sense try and forestall some of the things that that will definitely happen. All right, that's all I have to say. The end. I know. Yeah. Um, are are the materials that you would uh, uh, disinclined to use? Are the materials that you would exclude from your uh, 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 you know uh, stiffness or densities that you would uh, avoid in in I'm, your work? I, well, I've tended towards light woods. I've used woods as low as 0.28. And and um, and left it on the th thicker side, um, right. but it's, that's one of the ones that you know was I think in the 1990s, and I saw not that long ago, and the arching looked great. Um, yeah. So I don't worry about that so much. But if if it had been a Strad model and it had been flatter, I, I I don't think it would have done so well. I, I tend to use wood around 0.34 to 0.36 now. I like to have a radiation ratio above 16. That's the main thing, which however you get it. Um, right. But what I haven't never really done is is modified the arching according to the wood. I'm not saying that's a, a good habit of mine. I just have had no sense of what the connection would be. Um, 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 I, I, I don't I don't feel I have. I don't think, feel I have anything to go by. I mean, archings. They have to look a certain way, um, and they have to be healthy. And then I, I think of the choice of wood affecting my graduations more. Um, but I, I'm so far from having a unified vision of how they all fit together that that I I, I think you Andrew have thought a bit more about what to do, um, you know, in each case to put them together. I I I, I haven't, but. We we probably agree on the same things that you have to have um, good wood and and you have to have um, good archings. Um, but I can't say that changing the long, longitudinal arch makes a big difference. I mean, I, I know it does, but then when I try making an instrument and thinking I'm going to do something, I the differences I get between instruments anyway seems to overwhelm. Anything I'm trying to learn from, you know, the fine details. Um, if I'm honest, I like, you know, I, I like to think um, 
the, 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 an interesting instrument for me has been the biotone, which is unusual in that it's quite narrow, like 161 at the top. Um, it, it's, it's, it's up full length. It's one, it's two, um, what, 204 or something at the bottom and quite wide in the middle relatively. And it's got this sort of barrel shaped arching and it, it doesn't mess around curving down a lot. And the first three times, okay, well, this is something interesting. I made a copy from the CT scans originally, and that was a complete nightmare, but it taught me a big lesson. If you get arching templates from an old Italian and you put it on a new instrument with a, that's based on a flat plate, they'll never fit. There's no way, because, you know, the ribs are twisted. I mean, it's it's pretty simple, but I never realized that. You, you, you sort of grab these templates from a Strad magazine or something just to check, and they never fit. Or you get the ones from the crosswise and that doesn't fit the longitudinal one. And so um, the, the Vuitton is particularly distorted in that way. And so making ribs that way and then fitting it up, it was, <laughs> it was a complete nightmare. I had to open it, I think, three times to get it really sounding. And I made a couple more and each one I, I, I threw my hands up because it just had to open it so many times to get it sounding. But I felt I did get it sounding really well. And then somehow now I use it and it's more consistent, and um, I really like it. Um, for it's a compact instrument with a very brilliant sound. The original of the Vuitton was unusual in that it had a very full no. bass. I mean, it had very large um, um, A zero amplitude, and it had this great big spike in the in the upper range, about three point eight kilohertz, which is right on the smack on the ear's most sensitive zone, and my copies of, or and models based on that have, have by and large um, captured that. Maybe not as extreme as the original, but um, um, so I've been pleased with that. So that's my only sense of sort of a unified model arching. Um, and, um, but, and the, the arching can be quite high on that. Uh, you know, if, and again, how do you measure arching height if the thing's distorted all over the place? You, you need a 20 inch, you need a 20 millimeter block of wood to get it out of it, but the arching in the middle is really yes. only 15. Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's a, it's much more complicated than when when one understands from sort of the philosophical aesthetic treatments of it, which I guess would be my main message. Um, um, it's 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 a lot of fun to figure out idealized versions of things, and I think it's important for how we think about things, and it's also important to my mind to spend a lot of time copying things visually and checking with the templates later because that's how you develop confidence in your eye. Um, um, so, and I also think that um, whether you use a spline or a cycloid or, or a, um, some of the other things we talk about, um, they're all ways of approximating, you know, a shape in three dimensions. You can do it with a cloud of points with a scan. I mean, um, so, I, I don't think of any of the systems as being what the Italians did. I don't know what the Italians did. Strad evidently used some marching templates. Um, did Guarneri, maybe. I don't think um, it would be a huge challenge for anyone back then to draw the violin from scratch with a few circles. You know, I, it's just, I don't think anyone with a good idea would have trouble with it. Um, so I think it's a, it's a real, to my mind, a real, um, um, red herring to try and figure out whether some system could have been used by the old Italians or not. It's, um, I think it's much more interesting just to look at the results and, you know, see how it feels to us, see what it looks like. And, you know, for those of us gifted um, in analysis that way, and I, I'm not one of them, to, um, to try and see if there's some, you know, elegant formulas that can be put under it. Um, I think it was, um, who came up with this cycloid idea? There was an article in Strad Magazine, Quentin Playfair. Playfair. Did he, was he the one perfect name yes. for a violin maker in, yeah. in, in Harry Potter novel or something? <laughs> but um, um, did, uh, uh, Martin, did you come across it independently or were you aware of his work? You're muted, okay. Uh, no, I didn't. No. Ah, um, so and the, and then someone came up with the what was the other curve? The chain links. What's that called again? Catenary. 
catenary. Mm -hmm. Yes, that also. Who was it? Bill. Who came up with that? Was it Bill Fulton? Um, and I think what the difference. I, I know you have a, a circle section. If you have a spline, um, it tends to be a bit more pointed in the middle and flatten out towards the edges. So bent ruler, and that would give what you would think of as more of a Guarneri arching. Um, a cycloid, a Martin, is a cycloid a circle section in the middle and then a transfer? Is, or No, no it, it's, a, it's a circle which runs on the, on, a, on the plane and you put your, your pencil in and then it goes with a circle, it goes like this. I understand, but does it approximate a, a circle section in the middle well, or is a sine wave or, or, or yeah, nothing? Yeah, of course you can approximate it very easily, like it's very close to a sine wave. A sine wave, okay. Yeah, that's not a big difference. Okay, so there's all these ways of, all these systems you can put under it. And um, and there's certainly, as, as um, um, Andrew's demonstrated, there's straight lines involved too. So I think they're all useful in giving our brain something to hang on to. Um, at one point, um, at one point uh, within all of these, we're measuring the outside surface. So one of my points was the actual, you know, geometric thing is in the middle somewhere. So all of these within the framework of, you know, uh, a top that's three millimeters thick or a back that's whatever, you know, that's five a very millimeters thick. It's they're all kind of, of the same. They're they're not they're not mm -hmm. they, they can't be that different. Very good point. Yes. Well, I'll turn it over to, to uh, Joseph. Um, um, to one quick quite one question from Jim, and then we should go to Sam. Mm -hmm. Right. I um really enjoying this discussion. Uh, something I've given quite a lot of thought to over quite a number of years. Um, but particularly, I'm interested in the fact that uh, in order to form a, an opinion or to analyze arching of instruments, you have to be able to measure it accurate. And people have not been, you know, I've been quite unhappy with the traditional ways of doing that. Martin seems to be doing a good job of, I, I'll have to look at the recording to understand what he's doing. But I wanted to mention a, a article that I read in the New York Times several months ago. Um, I've got it up here. Um, the article is about the Elgin marbles and stuff, but that I'm going to uh, ignore that part. The interesting thing is they found a way to copy it using a device that you may already have in your pocket. Um, I'm just going to read from it. In March, the museum refused a formal request to scan the pieces. So um, the uh, technical director of the Institute showed up at the Duveen Gallery of the British Museum as visitors and resorted to guerrilla attacks. While security staff looked on, the two used standard iPhones and iPads, as many of the latest models are equipped with LiDAR sensors and photogrammetry <laughs> software to create 3D digital images. LiDAR is a type of time of flight camera that sends wait, waves of light pulses out in a spray of infrared dots to measure the distances as small as a fraction of a millimeter. Photogrammetry extracts the geometric information from an image and with overlapping photos of an object converts the uh, data into virtual computer model. The 3D images of the marble horse head, um, Martin will enjoy the fact that what they're copying is a horse head. Um, <laughs> the uh, 3D images of the marble horse head were uploaded into a carving robot, which shaped, pro well, the point is, there's, it seems now that there's a way to use an iPhone to accurately measure the arching of an instrument. I can send you a link to this article. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's astonishing what they're doing now. They, they, they take photos from tourists around public monuments and you put them into that software and you yeah. can get a very accurate um, 3D model. We've sort of come from, um, you know, they say that abstract painting came in after photography made it trivial to copy a likeness. I think we're at that state now with 
with with three D. It's it's trivial to capture a likeness now. The, I mean, back in the day, um, it was a huge thing to come across a cast of an old instrument, and wow, this is um, you know the, the, you know the, the secret of everything. And um, it, it's just, we're just not there anymore. So you're absolutely right, Jim. We're <laughs> um, it's sort of quaint talking about a lot of the techniques. We're well, we're as many about. of you know, I, I tried to institute study of instruments using 3D scanning. Um, and the, the problem with that is that the equipment and the software is so expensive and uh, um, that it's just not something you can practically have in your shop to work with. And, and it, even when we've done it a couple of times at, at, at meetings where I set arranged to have scanning of old instruments done, well, it, it just, it's problematic, but it seems like now you may already have the scanner in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And so I think it'd be interesting to look into using that tool. Yeah, I looked into it um, a, a few years ago and it, you couldn't get to a 10th of a millimeter type of accuracy, um, um, but maybe you can now. I, they're I, they're I, saying I, that you can now. Um, but, oh, well, that's, that is amazing then. And it specifically I could, mentions fractions of a millimeter. When I when I read that, I thought about putting a one of those phones right by the microphone on my radiation rig, and as you rotate it, <laughs> you you then have a scan which you can put in with the records. It, it's, wow, um, um, it's amazing what people are coming up with now. Just um, extraordinary. Um, oh, um, Luca. I just wanted to quickly mention, I've tried it already, photogrammetry on archings, and it works well with white stuff. So white backplate, I can scan quite easily, but you have problems with reflections on finished instruments. So the reflections complicate the calculations. So you would need to take thousands of pictures which are reflection free. And I guess ah. that's a lot of effort as well. So combining photogrammetry and CT scans is the way forward, I think because you can get CT scan 3D data and then just add in the textures from photogrammetry. Hmm. I wonder, would Polaroid lens on a camera help? You can reduce the reflections that way, but getting a reflection free picture is still, yeah. it's effort, I would say. And okay. since you have to take that many pictures, so for one backplate, I had to take like 300 pictures maybe to get a good reproduction then in photogrammetry. So for a whole instrument, it's lots and lots of pictures and getting all of them reflection free. Because if there's one picture that has a reflection and the, the program ends up not lining it well with the rest of the pictures, then the whole model doesn't work as well. So okay. I think it's too much effort, but on white okay. stuff, it works quite well. Well, we have a, a scanner, it costs maybe a number of thousand, I can't remember how many, um, less than five, I think. And it's a sort of a wand and you can quite easily sc scan things and then get a model. And it takes, but it takes someone with some digitizing skills to then clean it up and do something. But when I, when I come across an arching, I mean, I say, I showed you some simple tools. Now they think, and of course, when I come across an arching that I like one of my own or, or, or I haven't done it with old instruments, but I will tend to ask Lonnie to scan it. And then it is a record. And if I ever need to go back, there's a lot of information in, in, in there, but we could, we, we should, maybe we should yep. have a whole, whole session yeah, on yeah. these modern tools. Of oh, we, yes, we definitely. But we should get to yeah. Sam because it's, yeah, it's, we're please. getting late. And uh, so Sam's been waiting very patiently. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. How do I unmute? My... No, oh, well, wait a minute. You're fine, Sam, before. You just muted yourself. Ah, okay. <laughs> Well, that Good. was uh, that was amazing, and uh, a huge amount of great information. And uh, the thing about going last, I didn't actually request to go last. I offered. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but um, excuse me. But, I mean, a, a lot of great things have been covered, so I'm not going to recover them so much. Um, Andrew's talk about materials, I think, was very on track. Um, the link between arching and materials and model choice is very very interesting. I don't know if we totally got into that. But um, uh, I think that's uh, uh, just for a quick example of that, like uh, 
probably the two main models that I build in my workshop are Guarneri models and then late strads. Um, and late strads tend to be high arched and uh, the originals that I modeled them after were quite thin. So that works very well with a, a rather harder wood because uh, you, you want to go thinner on harder wood because it's heavier. Um, and then that works out because you you have a model that wants to be thinner anyway. So actually one uh, one working model I had, uh, well, just to, just to set a uh, tone for what I how I think about arching is I think this gets down to the central paradox of the violin, which is that it needs to be flexible to produce low frequencies and it needs to be stiff to produce high frequencies. And it needs to do both of those things simultaneously and it needs to not collapse. So those are all things that are all working against each other from an engineering point of view. So um, arching is a, a very clever uh, uh, kluge to, to fit flexible areas next on top of stiff areas, depending on which way the radiuses are going. So that's part of what we do is uh, with looking at arching is uh, other people have talked to uh, Jonas and uh, George uh, about, um, and, and Martin, everyone really, about uh, tracking shape. Um, myself, I tend to be very pragmatic and, and hands-on with this, so I don't do any scanning right now. Uh, one of the difficulties with arching is that there's so many different parameters, depending on which way you're looking at it, that it's very difficult to record it in a concise, quick, workshoppy kind of way. So um, I have a lot of information on my instruments, but arching tends to be, I tend to use shorthand to record my arching, which I say it was a Kreutzer style arching. I, to me, that means it was high, I have the, the height, and then I know that it was gonna have a long horizon and be a little bit full in the bounce, as opposed to if I say it's a Panette style Guarneri arching, I know that means it's gonna be relatively low, rather scoopy and uh, not much horizon. So that's a quick kind of workshop way that tells me a lot about the arching, but it isn't, um, it's not very specific in terms of parameters. Um, so in, lately I've been trying to track other parameters, you know, material properties, thicknesses, stiffnesses, and arching is still one which is a little bit of a, um, um, we're, we're just doing it on the fly still for me. So um, uh, another basic, I think, uh, principle which I have absorbed from, the, you know, my acoustic mentors is the idea that um, at low frequency, uh, the, the, the vibration of, and the flexation of a violin body is controlled by the shape. So it's very, you know, when you do regrads, if, um, it's very hard to change a lot of the character of the instrument or the frequencies of the B of the B1 plus much because that's controlled by the shape much. Once you've made your arching, there's less you can you can do with it. And then as you get higher and higher in frequency, um, it's less and less controlled by the shape and more by the material properties. Uh, you can correct me if I have misunderstood the principle, but I, I think that kind of applies. So um, uh, that means that at very high frequency, like I think sort of once you get above 2000 or so, I'm not really sure where the cutoff is, then the arch doesn't matter so much. And then, then the intrinsic property, the materials and the stiffness starts to matter more. What that means as far as picking an arching for the model, for example, is uh, that you know there's a certain stiffness that will support a, a, an instrument uh, statically um, and you can choose that, uh, well, like I said, like for, for a, a higher arch that you're going to want to go thinner on, if you, if you use stiffer, mat uh, heavier material, you're going to want to go thinner anyway. So then it works out that you have the arch, the strength, strength supported by the arching increasingly, um, and you can sacrifice the static strength of the thin, of the thickness, um, and it still works out. Um, so, uh, Anyway, let me just, I'll show a few images just to, it's gonna be a little scattershot because so much has been discussed, which great stuff. Um, let's see, how do I share a screen? Am I already squaring a screen? You already see me, right? Squaring a sheen. Oh, squaring? Yeah. You should be able squaring. to share your screen. You okay, click on well, the anyway, area. one of the things I, I just need to say is that uh, Martin Schleski's work in this has been inspirational to me from the beginning. And you know, I looked at all the pages on his website early on and that was a big uh, uh, inspiration for trying to gather many sorts of information, uh, modal analysis, spectral analysis, uh, photography, um, 
Um, so that's, you know, I didn't invent this approach, but I'm trying to use it. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we didn't discuss too much was the link between arching and model and, uh, and timbre. I mean, one thing also just worth saying is that basically everything on the violin is arching. It's all arching. Um, there's the exterior arching that you see. There's the interior arching, which interacts with it. There's the outline is an arching. Different curvature of the outline also affects the stiffness in similar ways. Um, but here's just a bunch of Del Jesus. Um, and then here is a few strads. Hold on. Oh, you I'm need to share your screen, screen. Sam. Oh, uh, okay. How do I do that? Uh, one uh, second. There's a green share screen button in the bottom. Okay. Can I choose a window? Yeah. This, there we go. Yeah. Okay. That looks good. Are we, are we good? Yep. Perfect. I see Strat 3D. Right. So I was just saying that this project, you know, has some, some history. Um, and some of the things I'm, sh I'm showing are available there. So uh, for free, if anyone wants to, to do their own work with it. Um, so here we're talking, I want to talk about the link between uh, model uh, and timbre. Um, personally, I feel like arching is the single biggest variable because between Strad and Guarneri, the wood is not all that different. The shape and the size is not all that different. The varnish is not all that different. And the thicknesses differs a little, but not all that much. The, the biggest really gross difference is the arching. Therefore, to me, I think that the arching is where the timbre differences largely lie. So here's a bunch of Guarneri's. Here is some Strad's. Um, I mean, just a quick, quick glance um, shows some real differences, but this seems very typical to me. What I tend to see on Guarneri's is quite a bit more prominence in this area here. Some people are calling it the, trans, the transition hill. I call it the projection region because I think this is responsible for an, a violin sounding very present and under the ear, particularly. And if there's too much, it sounds a little, like Martin said, a little vulgar or edgy. But if there's not enough, it sounds very smooth and doesn't carry as much. Um, and then there is, whoa, right. And then there's this area here, which I like to call the Dunval ditch, which most violins have some sort of low area in the middle. And on Guarneri's, it tends to fall a little bit on the high side, like here around uh, 16, 1700. And then the, the Bridge Hill takes off at about 1800 from there. Whereas on the Strads, I don't know if this is, maybe it's not so different. What you do see on the strads is the transition hill presence region is quite a bit suppressed compared to the Guarneri's. Um, so I'm gonna look also at my own project. So from Strad 3D, um, uh, this is an article, uh, it's, it's on the website. It was in Strad Magazine a year and a half ago or something. Um, and this is the three violins that were part of that study. The, the Titian Strad, which is the golden period, very moderate arching. The Wilmot Strad, which was a very, very high and very, very long elongated and puffy kind of arching. And then the Plowden, which is quite, quite low. So just based on what we were looking at before, like the green is the, the Guarneri. And um, it has the sort of things you'd expect. Um, this is one third of an octave smoothed. Um, it has a very full area in the B, um, raised in the transition hill, high-lying um, Dunval ditch, and in this case, a not super prominent bridge hill. Um, the Titian is blue and it is actually the most kind of uniform and has sort of an extended high end. And then the Wilmot, which is this orange, which had the very, very elongated arch, um, very full horizon, has that's orange and that has a very suppressed transition region, presence region, um, and less base response and very healthy um, Bridge Hill. So, um, so one of the questions, I know Martin did this years ago with his tonal copies. So it's the same idea. If you, use, if you follow the recipe, will you get the same result is the question that many of us have who follow classic models. So um, below is the three copies I made uh, fairly closely, um, trying to also choose somewhat similar wood. Um, and, uh, the green is my Guarneri copy. Like the Guarneri, it has an even higher uh, transition hill. Um, and it seems to have actually a little bit of a better bridge hill. So from a certain point of view, it may be, it probably is more powerful than the Plowden. Uh, my Wilmot copy is this orange 
Um, and it, similarly to the real world mod, it has a, a very suppressed transition hill um, and pretty good um, uh, bridge hill. So this is just to say, you know, it doesn't prove that it's the arching, but it just says that if that the, if following the model did produce a similar timbre, at least documenting it this way. And if you consider that the arching may be the most important variable that might be telling us something about the arching's effect on timbre. Um, just a quickly, I'll sh I showed some of this about a year ago or whenever it was. Um, uh, instead of displaying spectra as um, a graph, they can also be displayed as color bars um, where red is hotter and uh, blue is lower. So this is the same spectra as what we see above. And I find this useful for comparing many different fiddles. So I compared, um, right here what we have is, uh, I compared the data I had on my different models. Over here, these peach colored model names are all Guarneri's. Um, the Kreutzers are this little area here. This is like a shorter miniature Kreutzer I made, and these are Titians. And uh, so there's the bees, uh, there's the transition hills, and there's the, the hill, the bridge hills. And just a glance does show that there's like some, some real patterns like the Kreutzers seem to be quite hot in this region of the bridge hill. And the mini Kreutzers that I made for whatever reason are super hot in the bridge hill. Um, the Titians were much more moderate. And the Guarneri's, um, we can also look at it. Um, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this. Uh, here it, it's, uh, this is just everything reduced to three broad bands, low, low band, Transition Hill and Bridge Hill. And these are the Guarneri's here and Strad's here. And the Kreutzers you can see all have a quite suppressed uh, transition region. Uh, just to say that the, the models do seem to be, if you want to call it breeding true to their, to their, uh, to what's going on. So to me, you know, if arching is significant, I made this sketch right before, it's very, very crude. It's not super thought through, but I think we were all been talking about arching and you know, we started to develop a nomenclature for spectra some time ago. Dunwald started that, um, where we say, okay, from, you know, two to 600 is fullness and two to 4,000 is, is uh, brilliance. Um, so in order to start um, talking about arching, I think we need a nomenclature of arching. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not dealing with catenaries or, I mean, I use radiuses. I don't have problems with all those things. It's just when it comes to the reality of the violin, all we have is the surface itself. And I really want to address the surface. So uh, for example, uh, uh, this is, you know, that's the island and it tends to be more elongated, straighter lines going this way and a rather tight radius across it. And I feel like it's sort of an independent element. You can have a straight island on a low arch fiddle as long as everything else is pulled down around it. But so that's like an independent element. And then you have people who have been talking about these straight lines and, you know, they sort of are in this region. So really a lot of the structure of the violin is on the diagonal, not on, you know, it's like in the, on the along the, along the axis in the center and then along the diagonal in, um, in the flank. So if we call this the island, these might be, I call them the flanks just now. Um, this little area, and they're mostly, you know, they're a compound curve, like you get a different radius if you go this direction, this direction, or this direction. So they're not easy to define, but there are, is at least a little bit of a straight region which uh, can allow things to move. Um, uh, and then there's this area here, which I called, uh, as of an hour ago, the dome. Um, which means you have a com you have a compound curve there, you know, um, the, especially the the fuller the horizon, like on a full fiddle like the Wilmot or the Kreutzer, um, there's a lot of curvature lengthwise and there's a lot of curvature crosswise. So basically, this is a little quite strong little area. It's not going to move very much. Uh, um, and so you have similar. They're not exactly the same, but you have an upper dome and a lower dome, and then the channel. Um, is uh, I think very neglected very often. It's not just about recurve because if, it, if the violin was rectangular, then whatever channel you had would be an elongated shape. But because the violin is curving around, you are creating arching 
within the border, which is going to affect the boundary conditions a lot. Um, I'll show that in a minute. Um, I just proposed this, this could be um, modified, but for those of you who are doing simulations, you know, each of these areas could be selectively uh, uh, altered. Um, and, you know, you can have an arch which is quite flat going across the flanks. And then like a lot of Lake Gwyn areas are like this, they're quite flat going down and then they just dive into the channel. So they have a quite round channel with very little recurve, making a very, very stiff edge. Um, personally, I feel that those stiffer, the stiffness of the edge has a lot to do with the feel and the snappiness of the response of the fiddle. Um, so anyway, this is just a proposal for us to develop a better nomenclature for arching. And I almost need to leave it there. This is just a little gadget I made. Um, this is, we call this a snail. And I use that, I like little gadgets that you can use quickly to, to check a violin, to just get a reading off it, just like while it's sitting on your, your adjusting table. Um, doesn't involve a scanner, you just take it. The, the reason it has this cutout is so it can slip over the bridge and this goes under the fingerboard. So you can just sort of get a quick reading on what the island is like. Um, um, and then, uh, you know, other areas just to talk about, we're talking about the channel. Um, so like just looking across this area, for example, um, if you look at that from the side, you can see actually that it's it's not the the channel has created a quite little stiff arch going all the way down to the edge there. Um, just to so just to say that um, uh, who the various people who were talking about um, mapping shapes, you know, we have to go into more detail on that. So um, I, I'd be very open to more conversations with anyone who's doing modeling or finite element or anything related to this about what we could say about these individual shapes. Um, and that's it for my presentation. Almost pulled it in on time. All right. Perfect. Oh, can you unshare your screen? Uh, yes, how do I do that? Um, and, uh, so, uh, well, first let, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much. And uh, Colin. Unmute yourself and Colin, you're muted. Um, you, I thought start from, start from the beginning. You were muted before. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, as some of you know, I've done some uh, uh, quite a long time ago now. Some uh, simple um, um, analytic models to look to see just the generic properties that um, the properties uh, that they would have of the arching and the shape um, would, would, would have on the modes of first the free parades and then the assembled instrument. And everything that Sam was saying and everything um, uh, that, that uh, Martin was saying um, uh, was very much in, in I'm in total agreement and and for and Sam's picture that he's just shown I thought was absolutely marvelous that's the one that he was hand drawn if you go back to that um I know you can't just do that but you'll remember that and the particular areas um and uh he was showing um that they're the areas that the curvature of the instrument is either large or it's um, uh, rather small, and you know, particularly the diagonal ones are areas where the plates are much flatter, and therefore they can vibrate very much more easily. And you, even on the when you've got the assembled instrument, and look at the patterns of the modes, um, particularly the breathing type modes, B1 minus and B1 plus, um, you see that the vibrations are stronger. Uh, 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 like like um, what was shown before, um, in, in those flatter regions, those diagonal regions. And the effect of arching is very much to raise, as, as people were saying, the affected rigidity of the material. Um, I've got a slide, if I can just show it, just, just to illustrate that point. So may I just share my screen? Yeah, wait a minute. Also, I have to make you co-host. Okay, go ahead, Colin. I'm sharing my screen and I'm 
Can you see? Not no. yet. Okay, yes. something's happening. Yeah, okay. Can you you can see? Yes, this? we can see your slide. Okay. Now, um, can you see um, uh, the, this slide here shows you um, with a simple model, it's to, meant to be generic to, to get to lead to understanding rather than to give precise changes that you will actually see when you're actually making on a real instrument. But this is um, for, uh, for a, a guitar shaped, mimicking the actual shape of, of, of the top and back plates. And these are the modes um, of the freely supported plate. Now, if they were flat plates, as you increase the, um, uh, the speed of sound um, or the ratio of the elastic constant to the density, um, the, 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 these would increase um, with uh, uh, these frequencies that start down here with a flat plate arching zero. Um, and um, these would increase linearly with the thickness. And normally when you look at the textbooks, there's a lot of emphasis put on the frequencies of uh, plate modes, of bending modes, and bending modes, it's the thickness of the plates that determines uh, um, <clears throat> uh, what, how, the frequencies uh, at which they um, vibrate. So a very thin plate, low frequencies, very thick plate, high frequencies. Now, um, you can take this model, which has just got uniform properties. It's a 2.5 millimeter thick plate. Um, uh, has a, a unit, you, 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 it starts off here with a completely uniform elastic constants and density across the whole plate. And then you can see what the effect is. Um, I've already said what the effect of th changing the thickness would be. It would to change all these frequencies. And um, the blue ones are um, the um, symmetric models, uh, the, the modes, um, like, like the bending mode, longitudinal bending mode, um, this mode here, um, and um, this mode up here, um, which would be the mode five for a flat plate. Okay, it doesn't look like you normally see, because of course you're arched and you're dealing with anisotropic material as well. But let's just concentrate on arching just for the moment. What we can do on, on, on the computer is very easily um, change the arching height. And this is changed from no arching, five millimeters, 10 millimeters, and 15 millimeters. And you can see what the effect is on all, each of these modes. And you can see it's dramatic. Um, uh, you, you're, if you, let, let's just consider mode five, because it's the, the most important mode of the lot because it, it's the one that lead, results in the breathing modes of the B1 and B, B1 minus and B1 plus modes. Well, it's not directly, but that's another story. But um, this gives you an indication of how, how the B1 minus B1 plus modes would change um, uh, as you change from no, no, no um, arching to 15 millimeters. And you can see the, the frequency increases really quite dramatically. It's almost a factor of two, which would mean the equivalent of increasing the, uh, the thickness from 2.5 millimeters to five millimeters. Um, so in, in fact, the effect of the arching dominates in fact the thickness um, it, um, of, of the plates. Um, when you get up to large, large um, arching, and of course it increases all the time with the increased height of the arching, as you've seen. Um, so, but it's mode specific. I mean, it um, affects the symmetric modes, um, like mode five, rather than the twisting mode. The twisting mode, for example, down here, which is not really all that important in terms of the um, proportionate importance on, on the, um, the acoustics of the violin is, is much less sensitive, as is this mode here, which is mode, mode, mode three, 
um, uh, it's, it, it's the mode two, mode four, I believe, to be important as well. They're not simply mode two um, and mo mode, 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 mode five. So these two modes um, uh, uh, affect basically the, the B1 plus modes and the, 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 this one, this is the breathing mode. And of course, when you assemble the instrument, it's the mixture of these modes that actually from the top plate and the back plate that, that, that are important. Um, but all of them um, are dominated or increased remarkably by in fact the arching. So wherever there's, uh, uh, and it's, it's not simply the arching height, of course, it's the curvature, as others have actually mentioned, um, that's important. So any, any region of the plate that's got a lot of curvature um, is, is going to um, be much more rigid. It's it going to encourage modes to be, be higher in frequency. Those areas in the diagonal, the beautiful um, picture that um, Sam was showing us, hand-drawn hand one, um, they're, they're flatter regions, they're flat regions, and therefore they're more, more flexible and they therefore vibrate more strongly. And uh, those sorts of arguments have, uh, are, are equally important for the longitudinal um, arching because the arching at the ends of the instrument can be different on the instrument and it, and it matters. Um, basically, the more arching there is at the ends of the instrument, the more you confine the um, modes to the, um, the central part of the instrument away from the edges. So the curvature at the edges, I think is important because it essentially compresses the waves and increases the frequencies. So uh, again, the shape is of the um, uh, instrument is important, not only from the outline, but also um, from the, um, the, the, the arch arching that's, uh, that, that's localized close to the edges. I think that's all I want to say, because it's only right. backing up what many people have, have actually said um, from experience, um, but there's a very good scientific reason for, for, for this. Thank, Thank you. you, Colin. Thank you so much. Um, we have a bunch of questions. So Thomas. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually just had a quick question and thanks to everyone who's shared your insight here today. Um, one thing that's come into something that I've considered a lot is the combination of the top and the back arching and how they compare to each other because not just the modes of the top and the back themselves but also how the transverse waves and the sound react to each other and just wondered if anyone had any thoughts on um, or comparisons on different top and back combinations. Anybody want to handle this? Could you repeat uh, the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. Um, I my 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 question was just um, comparing the top and back combination of the arching in reference to like the transverse sound waves versus the modes of the actual plates themselves. And if there's been, if anyone has done any study on those combinations and whether there are better combinations or um, what the differences are between, let's say a higher arching on the top versus a flatter arching on the back or something like that. Well, well, George probably uh, has could, could say that have the most educated opinion, but my feeling about it is that the top tends to be very strong going into the end blocks um, and also tends to be graduated. Uh, you know, you don't tend to, at least according to folklore, that as I learned it, lore, you don't go thin approaching the block. So it means the top is rather strong approaching the, the bottom block. Um, whereas the back, um, often is very, very scooped out arching wise and often is quite thin near the block. 
So the way I think about it is that, uh, you know, some of the modes there, you know, if, if this is the end block end button over here, the, um, uh, as the instrument's moving, it's actually muscling the whole, you know, you, um, it's muscling the lower block. And so the top has more leverage because of its stiffer structure, whereas the back is more yielding because of its more flexible structure. Um, and I think the lower block area is pretty, um, you know, that lower bout is sensitive. So that would be one reason why I think the arches are the way they are. That's interesting that there is so, <laughs> no one's jumping in there. I, I, um, I, when I think uh, of the difference between a strat and a granary, I immediately think about the top because but um, would, if we throw out the question, are back arches usually lower than top? Would, I mean, do people generally, if you make a high top arching, do you necessarily make a high back arching? Anyone got, I, I don't. I, I, don't. Um, I don't think it's the height that's so significant. I think it's the profile. Um, in general, actually, my, my arch heights often start out pretty similar, maybe the top a little higher. The tops do get higher in use, I think. From the sound post of the base bar, um, but I think it's the um, th that's something that I had studied a little bit on my own instruments and and uh, and postulated about on old instruments is that um, is that uh, the the tops if you look at old tops usually like a lot of them you can feel like you can look right into the f holes like they're stretched out um, and also um, and. Well, so looking at the C bouts on tops, if you measure flat the caliper, backs and tops on old violins, um, many of them have the tops rather narrower by a, a millimeter or several millimeters narrower than the back. And I think that's because the whole top has been going like, you know, well, I don't know that the top is getting pushed up, but the, it, the back is going down and the C, C bouts are getting pulled down. So effectively the top measure is higher. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, I don't think it's the, the height exactly. I think it's the shaping of the horizon. Uh, right. Uh, I, I don't think people are jumping in because I don't exactly think I understand the person's question. Um, that is there a preference for combinations of a higher or lower plates? Is that, is that the question? Uh, I think that, uh, oh, maybe I didn't answer um, the question then. No, no, no. I, under, uh, I, I, I understood uh, the question uh, between yeah. is there a is there a ideal back arching to go with a given top arching or is there something yeah. connected? Yeah, there? basically that was that's that's basically what I was saying. Like, is if has there been any study on ideal combinations between the two? Because um, yeah, obviously the reflected sound as well and the pressure waves inside the instrument, you know, are also a factors as well as the you know modes of the actual plates themselves. There is wrote a uh, paper would, years ago. Could, could, be, could I just come in for just for a second? Um, uh, the, the arching around the edges um, of the plates in the assembled instrument make it that area really rather rigid. Um, and that's actually quite important because the, the coupling between the plates is provided by the ribs, largely. Air has a small effect, but the, the ribs are the most important things in giving the coupling. The whole problem of you know, how what, what one should do to match the top plate to the back plate is another area which one could talk, spend a lot of time. But, but the, the fact, if, if it were not rather rigid, the coupling between the two plates would be much weaker um, because to what you've got to it's it, it, the bending waves that, that you're exciting in the, in the radiating modes. Um, it's the bending waves uh, at their edges, which are the ones that in fact take much of the energy that goes into the top plate into the back plate. And that, that it, it's if 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 the if it were rather flexible and too flexible there, it would be much less effective of, of forming that coupling, and that would have a, a, a presumably a de de detrimental effect on the 
um, the, the the acoustics, the instrument. But what the what the, the optimum coupling is is a completely different ballpark um, uh, which, uh, and problem, uh, which we can't possibly talk about here as well. Um, but you might think you want to make it as strong as possible, so that so they're, 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 that you get as much energy in a certain sense transferred um, to the back plate as you, as uh, as as um, going into the back into the top plate, so that they were vibrating with the top plate and back plate with the same amount of energy, and therefore hopefully um, acoustically. Um, but it's the acoustic thing that's important. So it, it like the violin, everything is complicated. Um, if I can jump in. Yeah, so go this, ahead. Um, so I, I would say that the, the, right. the, the premise of the question, the I premise of the talk. question, uh, the premise of the question I would say is um, is false, that, that there is some, perfect solution or there is some perfect relationship um, between the two. If anything, sort of Sam's graph of his three instruments, there are three successful instruments, all with different um, solutions to the problem. So there is the problem of what do you want the instrument to sound like? What are the materials you're using? And how do you fashion them? Each, each will have an effect on the, the the materials and the arching, the solution of the arching and influence on what the instrument sounds like. So there, there is no proper relationship. There's only the relationship that gets you to the end solution that you're uh, wish to get to. Um, so to say, you know, high arching, high arching is right, or high and back is low. And no, that's the wrong um, premise, I think. Um, the premise would be what's the influence on the sound and is does the arching satisfy the materials um, that would be my take my my uh, I would opt for a more simple view of it yes and yeah. actually I, I I agree with that very much I, I'm just curious if there's been any research on those you know on the combinations between the two rather than just applying the arching to one plate or the other plate, for example. I think there's I think a, the, the simple research, answer is no. There, there's there a research paper research. done by Harris. I think a VSA yeah. journal published it some years ago, talking about the uh, shuffling back and top arch of different height and also different arching long arch profile. But I don't know what what was the uh, it was a. I don't remember the, the conclusion, but it was dealt at least a part of the question you asked. But if this, this is the problem that you, if you speak about arch height as some absolute uh, measurement. It's as if arch height is independent of the materials that you use. So if you don't know the materials, saying what the arch height is, is not meaningless, but is not very helpful. I would say. Well, arch height is a fact that's easy to measure. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah, not, it's easy to no measure. More. But it, it's but it, like it, this house is three stories high. That doesn't, you know, it's a, it's a, it's just one picture uh, that needs other elements to actually define it properly. Um, I, just, I, I think we'd all agree with with that. I, I certainly. Agree. Yeah. I mean, just having the length of the room is a not a good estimate of the area. I mean, you need. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Let's go to uh, Luca. Yeah, and my question was about Colin's slide that he showed. So I know it's been a long time since we saw that, but um, in general, you you know, Colin, that I made plates with different arch heights, controlling for thickness and material properties. And generally, it agrees well with your simulation results. So the first and fifth plate mode were highly dependent on arch height. But for the sure. second plate mode, it was really not dependent on arch height at all. So for all six plates with varying arch heights from the lowest 12.1 to 17.4 millimeters, the second plate mode changed by maybe three hertz or something. So not a lot of dependency and also not, not very like 
it's not very I, I agree with you on that. Yeah, the second play mode doesn't seem to care, but I, I can't explain it. Like I would expect it to be arch, arching dependent as well, of course, but it doesn't seem to be in my practical. How much system. did the other two change? You went from, uh, you say 15 to 17 or 14? I, I made six plates. Two of them were 12.1 millimeters, then two uh -huh. were 14.5 and two were 17.4. Wow. And so and, it shows a large. Deviation. And what, were, what was the frequency span for the uh, other modes? See. Um, you should write that up. That's a very good experiment. Yeah, it's it's my uh, PhD. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, Excuse see, me. I, I have it open in the background. Uh, I just have to find. So the first plate mode for the lowest arch height was 91 hertz. So 12.1 millimeter arch height on a back plate uh, gave 91 hertz. Then 14. Oh, sorry, it was 14.8 was the middle thing. They had 98 hertz for the first plate mode, and then it went up to 102. And the other plate was 103 for the 17.5 hmm. uh, arch height. So that's the first plate mode. And the second, they were all pretty much the same, around 150. And then the uh, fifth plate mode is about 60 hertz higher for the highest arch height than for the lowest arch height. So a large wow. difference. But for the second plate mode, if at all, a very small difference, which was very surprising to me. Like I would expect Collins results to reflect reality, but just from that one uh, experiment, I didn't see that. I, so, I don't see it either. I have a large database on uh, 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 resonances in free plates, violin mm -hmm. plates, uh, trying to find a model uh, to, to predict the uh, free plate modes from the other uh, information. So I'm interested in your data. Is it yeah. open? Uh, Is I it can open? send you a Google Drive link with some tables. Okay. And everything I'm very interested. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that suggests to me that if you have, um, if you want to make a bigger spread between mode two and mode five, um, make a higher arching. Yeah, that's what I think too. And like, I wanted to go for that. So I chose high archings in the past. So uh, the top plate as well. Um, but then again, we didn't find a large influence on sound. Like we did some <laughs> listening tests with these instruments and the 12.1 millimeter arch height was not reliably distinguishable from the 17.4 so well it I, seems to make a big difference in the in the structural data that i gather but then if there's no perceptual difference then maybe but these are first results right <laughs> I well, I, but almost and we've been had hard time getting good perceptual differences for anything so i wouldn't be too hard yeah. on yourself. in the radiation measurement it, the differences are clear like you can see them ah. in the radiation of the instrument and the radiation measurements that, that's not a problem just the perception it's hard to tell the differences still and um, what were the differences in in mass uh, they are pretty much the same let me see um so the lowest arch height was a little bit lighter in the end at 94 grams and the highest arch had a little, oh, sorry, the lowest arch had was a little bit heavier at 96 grams, and the uh, highest arch had a little bit lighter at 94 grams, so two grams difference. Not that and much. The, and the criteria of graduation was what? Just all the same. So the graduation is the same over all the plates. Was this, like a, so I could make it, right? Are you talking about the top plate or the back plate now? This is the back plate now. Oh, yeah, okay. I mean, the, the top plates are the same as well. So, uh, but they are also the same arch height. I just wanted to change just the back arch height. Hmm. Very okay. interesting. Oh, well, if you just change, if you just change the back, uh, so you, you determined that the back plate did not make that much of a perceptual difference, but it doesn't address the top arch at all. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah very true. And yeah, I, okay. I would expect a bigger difference from the top plate. Hmm. And that's why I tried the back plate first. Like, do the easier stuff first. The, cool. <laughs> like changing the top arch height, you have to change a lot of stuff then, right? Mm. Rich height and everything. Bravo. George? Um, as um, you most of you know, the uh, Bill Bell project uh, uh, addressed the question of matching uh, tops and backs with different uh, impedances, which is 
just some calculation involving the the mode frequencies and mass which is how its dynamic stiffness rather than its static stiffness and uh, we've found definitely with tops if you uh, go excessively in one direction with that it's bad news <coughs> it was a lot less clear with the backs i mean they in general the, the very stiff high high impedance back was not particularly well liked but there were certain things about it and actually the rather thin back was uh, uh, uh liked a lot it was one of the favored violins but we chose to do those differences in impedance by graduation but we could have done it uh, we, uh, uh, in part at least by changing the arching heights uh, as Luca did but it wouldn't be exactly the same thing it would be uh, the same for some of the modes but less so for others but it would be rather similar so I think when you take uh, when you make these very very large differences it's quite easy to say this this was uh, beneficial or this was a disaster I think if you bring the impedance of the two plates rather closer to the normal one so that would be so using Evans numbers uh, like around about 30 ish for a plate without a base bar top without a base bar and 60 for a back but if you worked with plates for that were just a little bit above or below that I think it would be pretty well impossible to disentangle our perceptions about it we would the the, the um micro differences due to wood properties and other things would um overwhelm them and we really wouldn't be able to come away with a clear result but you, obviously George. obviously some kind of matching up of top and back is is a good idea because uh they both uh, collaborate with this, particularly with this breathing mode, and to some extent also with the longitudinal dipole, which you don't see until around about 850 hertz. And it's obviously necessary to have to exploit the longitudinal stiffness of the top, uh, which is in part due to the arching and in part due to the anisotropy, because we need that for for the structural stiffness to to bear the the, the tension of the strings we don't have that requirement of the back we don't have this uh, plate chopped up by the f holes so we are to some extent deliberately isolating the upper valve and the lower valve via a, a stiff central region um, and also okay. that serving a purpose that stiffer region is providing some kind of foundation for that end of the sound post so there are, are modes in which both of the ends of the sound posts move together and there are others where they're fight fighting each other the, the the wood would naturally move in opposite directions in the top and back but they're tied together by the sound post so uh I think some of Collins models actually show that the um if we look at uh things like these uh, stiffness at the scene by the um, back end of the sound post uh, alongside the stiffness of the bass bar and look at this these two separate sets of asymmetries that were deliberately put into the island uh, I think he found that there were some quite interesting things in how in how the um, uh, bridge hill was formed by uh, getting those ratios uh, to be in good so I, th I think we are sure that there are better and worse things you can do about matching a top to a back but the the very big differences are going to be easy to see and the more subtle ones are going to be very confusing and, and difficult to come away with a clear result thank you Don. yeah am I coming through yes, yes. okay uh just initially my general approach is that uh, plate modes free plate modes aren't that informative they can be misleading but uh, one interesting thing is that in the recent thinning of the plates you know I don't want to compare one plate to another plate because there can be all kinds of differences but in thinning a plate I was plotting the frequency of the modes versus the weight and for mode one and two it was pretty much proportional to the weight 
which you would expect if the frequency is driven by bending stiffness. But mode five was different. It was not proportional to the weight. If you projected the line down to zero, there would still be about 100 hertz or so frequency, which doesn't make any sense if it's bending frequency. But if it's a stretching frequency, then that makes some sense. So my interpretation is that mode five includes a significant amount of plate stretching that forms its stiffness. Now that's of interest to me because I want to figure out you know, how the stretching and bending modes affect the assembled instrument. I keep thinking back to Evan Davis and his ring mode where the frequency of a curved surface is proportional only to the speed of sound in the wood and the radius of curvature. And so if you thin that area, you won't affect the frequency of that area at all if it's controlled by the ring mode. Anyway, my view is that it's all a big mix of all of this stuff, a terrible mess. But uh, one other observation is I had independently come to the same observation of Sam about higher arching, suppressing the transition hill. Now, the first thing I saw was uh, Bill Sloan's Strad, which is fairly high arched. And it was just, you know, the transition hill was just so low and the bridge hill was really high. But I saw that in other even modern examples, a similar trend. So that's all I've got to say, thanks. Um, well, well, what you're saying about mode five being an extensional mode is something that um, Jim Woodhouse has, I believe, written about and certainly talked about. And so graduating doesn't affect mode five as much as the lower ones. Um, so again, having a higher arching, um, let me see. No, no. Scotch that, <laughs> scotch that thought, okay. I would think that the higher arching would put more stretching mode into play in mode five. Oh, so yeah. you'd get a higher mode five. It does, exactly. So um, instinctively, I wanna say that extensional modes are more or less restricted to low frequencies. Is, is that true, Colin? I mean, where there's a lot of extension, because there'd have to be well, I mean, uh, 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 arching in the sense is always more important in the low frequency modes. Uh, because when you get up to high frequencies, the wavelengths of the sound in the plates gets um, smaller than the radius of curvature. And then um, uh, um, you, you get into a different regime. Um, but, but the interesting thing is from the computations, or my computations at any rate, with simple systems, um, which ought to followed through to the more complicated systems um, is that all the low frequency modes, um, and I've only got them in my, the publication I gave uh, 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 up to about 400 hertz, which is really quite low, but there's you know, about seven or eight, but, but I've, I go up to about 40 modes. And I ought to go back and look at some of my data that I've computed and look at the very high frequency modes to see the effect that, 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 it, that it might have. Um, I'd be very interested to see that. Uh, the, the other thing that we haven't mentioned at all is anisotropy. Um, and um, uh, most people when they're dealing with the anisotropy problem say well, it's much more difficult to measure the flexural 
um, um, transverse um, velocities. So they tend to go um, and try and relate things to the longitudinal um, uh, um, velocity uh, of sound and modes to that. Whereas, of course, all the modes that one looks at are two dimensional. And therefore, almost all the modes of the violin will depend almost equally at low, low frequencies on both the transverse velocity of sound um, and um, the longitudinal. Um, and particularly when you get into areas like, like the, the bending of the um, reflector areas of the center bar, um, that, that, that obviously what's happening in the transverse modes, it becomes more important. Um, would you say then, would you say then that the, an average of the two would get, be a better predictor of yes. overall I mean, frequencies? That, that, that is indeed in what, what I did in my earlier paper. Um, because all the modes are essentially two dimensional and, it, um, and therefore, um, if it was an isotropic material, you have both the longitudinal and transverse the same. Now, as um, uh, uh, what, what, what actually happens when you um, have uh, an, uh, an, an isotropic problem, it, since you're going to, the mode shapes tend to be rather much more, you see the anisotropy gets up to about 25 or something like that, which is huge. That's the difference in the elastic constants along and uh, and transversely, um, uh, and that 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 really is uh, really important. Yet you don't see that reflected in the mode shapes because what Sam was saying, uh, I think it was Sam was saying, the mode shapes are largely determined by the geometry, certainly at low frequencies, uh, and that that's actually true. But even higher frequencies. It, um, you're getting waves that are in, in uh, that are confined to the the geometry of, of the edges. So um, uh, I'm 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 losing myself at the moment. Yeah, I mean one one thing about uh, the anastros. Anastros, yeah. Right. Uh, so anyway, I, 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 yeah. May I just interrupt? So what 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 I did was to look at the geometric mean, because if you take the geometric mean, you're, 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 you're using them both, for an effective um, elastic constant equal to the effective mean uh, of the longitudinal. And, and if you look at that, you find that the, uh, if you keep that constant, the effect of uh, anisotropy is much smaller. Um, now, so um, there's no ideal thing, um, uh, but, but taking the longitudinal um, velocity alone and um, the elastic cost in that direction, you're exaggerating largely, widely, the um, effect of uh, that um, the elastic constant has on the actual mode shapes and um, the, mo the mode frequencies. But that well, this is all another area that, that perhaps we could talk about it at another time. But um, uh, the the transverse uh, um, sound velocity is just as important as the the, uh, the longitudinal one it, for for most modes of the violin up to high frequencies. And well. Well, and Sam, you were, you had a thought. Please. Well, I mean, one of the things is that much of the design of, and construction of a violin is made to make it as flexible as possible crosswise. The Fs are elongated. The straighter lines of the arch are more, are at most diagonal, if not straight. Um, the greatest curvature is in the other way. So we start with wood that's stiffer lengthwise, and then we have an arch that's stiffer lengthwise. Um, and uh, so that that crosswise flexibility, um, I think that's why you know um, even quite wood that's that's quite soft crosswise can still sound quite well. The violin itself is designed to to work that way. 
Um, and then you have the spiny, this, the, the, the tight radius in the middle of the violin to keep it all from just folding in on itself. Indeed, would it be bad to have too high a cross grain stiffness? Yes. I mean, so um, my, my data would say yes. Okay. But, I but, think um, but, but, but one of one of the important properties of, of spruce is that it has this huge um, change, much more so than the maple. Maple is about four to six or something like that in elastic constant. Where, where, whereas spruce um, is, is typically in the region 15 to 25. 15. To well, I, I'm speaking just order of magnitude. But but it's, it's right, 15 to 25 is a, no, a huge tra an, um, an, um, um, anisotropy. And then when you carve at an angle, it gets yeah. even more extreme. Yeah, exactly. And you go oh. cross, cross grain as well. Um, but hold on, the, the, the speed of sound across the wood isn't anything like 15 times slower. What, no, what, no, it isn't. Is? no, it's the square root of that. So, but it's still a factor of five. Five as opposed to two. For may, 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 maple, you know, square root of six, make it, make it four beside that's two. Um, and, 20, and 25 is five. So there's a factor of two and a half or something like that in the, in okay. the speeds of sound. Okay, that, that sounds about right. Uh, Anders? That, 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 the, 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 all the frequent, the bending waves and longitudinal waves are all proportional to the, to the, speed, the speeds of sound, in fact, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anders? It involves the density as well. Yeah, I, I wonder, I think that it's very interesting to see Sam's data. Uh, um, but I wonder, uh, and it's uh, neat, uh, important to, for me to know that uh, arching is, is important, but I wonder, the, the Jesus are, are, uh, are a little bit smaller than the strads in general. Yes. Uh, do you think uh, the difference between those in size play in a role? I couldn't say no. I, I don't. I don't have any way to equalize that. Okay. I, but I would, uh, but I just yeah, say like I, even even between the Titian Strat and the Kreutzer, um, yeah. the Kreutzer is a bit of a larger fiddle anyway. But um, uh, but then I made a miniature Kreutzer, which is like uh, like the length of a Del Jesu, and it was very similar profile. Okay. Sound -wise. So what happens? Well, what happened? You talk about uh, a small strat as well, and I guess it's only about millimeters. But what yes. happens to the power, and does it become stronger? I don't have a. I, I made I made three of the littler ones, yeah, and they were stronger. They were more brilliant in the in the bridge hill. Okay. But I don't. I don't. You know, it's not a very controlled study. Okay. It's and there's the main theme either today, so but thank you anyway. But Anders, I'll, I'll send you some of uh, what I'm working on. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, Anders, yeah, Anders, I'm not sure it makes a. I'm not sure the length. So the the length of the fiddle makes much difference. I don't know how much difference it makes to the deflection of the arching, but to the resonance, it makes a big difference. If you think of a beam, you make a beam. It's the same height, but you just shorten it a little bit. The resonance goes up very quickly. Yeah, you but the length. That, that is the that is the effect I think that the shorter body has on the behavior. The so, I don't know how much. This, so if you were to, to build a more powerful instrument, which way would well? You it's natural. Think of, think like the difference between a big viola and a small viola. Yeah. Like the problem with a small viola is because the natural resonance of the of the longitudinal bending goes up really high. It's really hard to overcome that. Yeah. Um, that's a that's it's a smaller effect than the Del Jesu compared to a Stradivari. But if you think like the biggest Stradivari is like a G form and a small Guarneri, that's a big difference in the resonance of they they naturally want to have a higher resonance. 
Uh, but I would actually say that the the B modes tend to be lower on the coronaries that I yes, mentioned. but that's because they have much lower archings. Yes, I would say like things like yeah. the panette or something like that. Right, it's got the arching really low to overcome this effect of having a shorter beam or shorter arch length, hmm. uh, you know, sort of body length. Um, that's uh, that's how I see it. Yeah, I, I, that sounds right. Okay. Well, I think if, if you can imagine a knob that turns the sound all the way from cello up to violin with viola, you really can feel like you're turning the knob because, you know, a 17 inch viola and a 16 or 15 and a half with the violin, it's really quite a small difference in percentage. And I, it, I'm always kind of amused when violinists get very exercised about a big violin. Well, it's only uh -huh. actually um, <laughs> a couple of millimeters longer, but they feel these things very very strongly, um, but 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 certainly you hear violas saying, "Oh, I want a bigger instrument for a bigger sound." And of course, that's you know, in terms of if we think of bigger sound meaning more projection, then go with one the size of a violin because it's just um, better at the high frequencies, which are are more important from that, as as, as we all know. Um, so Joseph, at this point we're we're it's almost four o'clock and we've been at it for almost three hours. So I think we should congratulations everyone. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think we should give a, another round of applause and thank you for our panelists. You know, thank you so much and all the other people who have contributed um, to this um, uh, great discussion. And um, 